amazing to see people from everywhere, really. I mean, all of amongst the online registrations, there are people from all over Europe, from Africa, from all over the place. And it's just amazing to watch these uh, registrations come in in a way that I really uh, couldn't have anticipated. So obviously we're doing something right. And, and it's a great pleasure to see you all here today. I propose that we start off before I hand over to the first session, the chairs of the first session, which is going to be Helmut and Charlie Karras. Um, I propose to just tell you a little bit about what links is and about some of the things that have been going on the last year. And then uh, to have some comments from the uh, chair of our external science advisory board and also of our board who, are, who reflects our stakeholdership for the three faculties in, in, in Lund, uh, medicine, engineering and science. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, show, I'll tell you a few things about what, what, what's been going on and what our mission is and uh, how far we've been getting with that mission. So anyway, Lynx was set up um, by, well, the first director was Peter Schultenberger, who is actually here online, um, as you can see, and he, and it doesn't advance. Why, why, why? Is there any? Is it? Is it top? Sure. Now, sorry. Right, okay. So Links was set up um, by Peter and other colleagues um, as an advanced study institute, I guess partially inspired or, or maybe more than partially inspired by the Carverley Institute in the, in the USA. And everybody knows about the Carverley Institute and what it now does. It's sort of expanded uh, greatly over the years. Uh, and in the Swedish context, it was designed to set up, set up interactions for guest researchers, schools, try, tryouts, uh, hackathons. I'd never heard the word hackathon before I came to Sweden, but it's actually quite good, so it works. Workshops, conferences, and symposia. And uh, it provides space, resourcing, and time to bring people together who just otherwise wouldn't interact at all. Uh, it's based around, at its core, it's based around the concept of themes. Themes of a finite duration, three years duration, they can't just go on forever and ever. Uh, and with a view ultimately to sustainability that things sort of keep going uh, at the end of the three years and, and that something indelible has happened and carries on. And with a particular emphasis um, around the exploitation, not exclusively, but, but particular emphasis around the exploitation of the big facilities for whom we have senior management representation here today, which is very nice. So, uh, and, and the, the themes come from the community. They don't come from us. We don't suck them out of our thumb and we don't, uh, we don't steer this process so we can talk freely about it when people have their ideas and so on. Uh, we have an external advisory board. Uh, um, Christian Alba Simonesco is, is the interim chair. She will say a few words uh, in a minute after, after Anders has spoken. And, uh, and those, so there we are, these themes. And it started off with three three themes and we're now growing because we've sort of broadened the remit and I'll say something a little bit about that in a second. This gives you some idea of the sort of outreach and interconnectivity that we've developed, some of the statistics, some of the, low, the panoply of logos they're showing, some of the people involved and some of the numbers as well. The only point of that slide of course is to, is to actually give you a feeling of, of the wide level of engagement that we have um, within and without Sweden. Um, and the first three themes uh, were sort of what they're called legacy themes here. They've all sort of completed in the first three years. One, the first one I was slightly involved in, I was, in fact, I was in the core group, was, in, was integrated structural biology. Um, uh, there was another one called dynamics, and there was a third one called imaging. And out of those uh, have grown lots and lots of different things, including, uh, in some cases, uh, inspiration for the next set of themes, which also went through and were, was approved by our external advisory board. So that was, that was the first set of themes and that they've completed, as I said. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, three current themes and we have some new ones coming in as well. So we've got three current themes. This is the integrated pharmacology and drug discovery theme, which is uh, based on a whole lot of issues relating to drug design, drug delivery, imaging, and so on, biological and biomedical imaging. And, um, it distinguishes itself in many ways, not exclusively, uh, but it does distinguish itself in that it has, as part of it, uh, it has the chief scientific advisor of Pfizer in, as part of the core group. So that's a very important thematic thing, and it's going very well. It's, it's progressing very well. Carrie Lindquist is here somewhere, and she is in charge of it. Uh, so she's actually just down the corridor from me in the lab next door to me in the medical faculty. So. Um, so it's good that that's going so well and lots of things are going on. Then we've got 
Northern Lights on Food, which is something that grew out of, if I'm not mistaken, the imaging theme. It's also, it was booted up out of the imaging theme. It uh, has sort of, it's grown uh, hugely and it's diversified in all sorts of different ways. So it's no longer something, although it grew out of links and it was stimulated by links, uh, it now has various aspects that go well beyond that. And it's doing extremely well. And as a model for something that uh, is, is, to, is designed to be sustainable, it, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So there's a lot going on there. Um, the whole idea is that with the themes is that you have a core group of people and then you have working groups sort of clustered around it with particular uh, specific areas. So in the case of Karin's theme, for example, there's working groups on structure-based drug design, there's, there's uh, working groups on antibody, there's one on, on biological imaging, and there's one on drug delivery, if I think there yeah, is. Yes. So those are just examples of the sort of working groups clustered around the core. Anyway, uh, and then the, the last of the three current ones uh, is New Materials, which uh, is led by Liz Blackburn, and, and this is, uh, so it's all about new materials and you know, light harvesting, charge transfer process, exotic magnet, magnetic fields and so on. So a lot going on there. And, um, and so, so I'm actually not quite sure. So, oh, right, right. So anyway, so, so in terms of our mission, we have, uh, I mean, when I came in, it was very, when I came in and I was being interviewed actually, I was, it was very easy for me to write a whole lot of things down on a list without actually having to think about what it would actually take to get some of them to happen. Um, so so the, the notions of what I wanted to happen, uh, I could, Martin just has souped up this slide uh, with a sort of a, I'm not sure whether this is a Judy, a Judy Garland road to, anyway, um, it, it, it's, it's very good. Uh, but it was very easy to write some of these things down and, and to think, yeah, these are things that should happen and that need to happen. Uh, and to think of some of the actions that we needed to, to work on. Uh, and of course, now having arrived, it, 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 there's been a huge effort um, from from within links and from within with, from within, within the community uh, to try and make it all happen and try to put the resourcing and the wherewithal and the impetus and the momentum and gathering people together to make it all happen. And so there's new communities, international growth, national 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 engagement because it was perhaps arguably a little bit too Lund centric. Uh, and of course, to think about what's going to be really necessary for everybody in the future, and that is to think about the next generation of PIs. Then you know, when, when people like me are sort of, you know, um, sitting on the sidelines, and, and we need all of the, the, the large fraction of young people here to be thinking about what they're going to do with these amazing capacities that are being built up uh, in in and around uh, Sweden. So uh, that's that's the sort of links mission in, in a very sort of broad way. Um, we have one of the things that we've done. Uh, I mean, I'll try and sort of summarize some of the things that have been done during the, the, the time that I've been here. Uh, one of the things that we've done is that we've made sure that the, the theme application process is open to anybody. It wasn't like that before. Uh, and we've tried to broaden that. That brings with it all sorts of issues relating to resourcing and a model for a business model, if you like, or working model for it to, to work by. And that's been tricky, uh, but we think we've addressed it and we think we've addressed it rather well. Uh, and it's now possible for anybody anywhere to apply for a, a Lynx theme within the confines of the way we set up the model and to have core groups and working groups from anywhere at, at all, as long as we have this sort of model right. Um, so we have a set of rules and so on. And then there's, there's various models for doing this, the Helmholtz schools and so on. There's various models for doing it. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's worked rather well. And the first call that we had was at the end of last year. It went out in November, I think it was. And uh, we had a number of applications that, were, that came in, um, of which three, it was a two-stage application process, uh, and uh, three of them were selected, and three of them were actually finally uh, approved uh, just recently. One on cultural heritage, one on chemistry of life, which is external from, it's headed by Leicester University in the UK. Climate environment. So there's a lot of stuff that's now going. They're going to have three extra themes in addition to the three themes we already have. So uh, that is uh, a, a big thing for, for that, and it will have a, a strong impact on the types of discussions that we um, were involved in. Uh, we also have put in, uh, in collaboration with uh, Max Four and ESS, we've put in an application to 
the Swedish Research Council for so-called Center of Excellence. This is a call that went out last year, um, which we know we are well aware of, that, of the fact that, you know, just about everybody in, in the country will have applied for one of these things. So we're not totally naive about the sort of, you know, the, the, the competition that's going to exist. Uh, there will be 10 of these centers and we uh, reckon in all modesty that we put in a very good application in collaboration with our, with our Central Facility Partners, and we think we did a good job there. So <coughs> if we don't get it, we'll feel unlucky, but obviously those are the breaks and that's just the way it is. If it works out, um, then uh, it, the whole thing is based on empower, empowering the Lynx model and the Lynx mentality and the Lynx activities for the whole country much more than it has done so far. Uh, so uh, we would want to extend the capacity of Lynx to run a much larger number of themes uh, so we could end up with something like 12 or 13 in, in total in the first five years. Uh, we'd want to distribute the resources. We, it, the model works such that we will distribute the resources uh, nationally uh, so that the, the whole country gets, gets brought in. And behind all of this, again, the exploitation of, of, the, of the central facilities for the country, given the very large investment that the country is making for these facilities, both for the national one, the national one such as Match 4, and, and, and of course the international in the formal ESS. So that's the idea. And um, we, uh, we, yes, so, yes. Anyway, so, so uh, it would be used uh, to uh, uh, fund activities led by uh, Swedish partners. It, it would still go through our advisory, our external advisory board, our independent international advisory board. Um, and we would have guest researcher programs for the, all of the eligible themes and uh, placements that could occur anywhere in Sweden. And we would have a co-funded postdoc program as part of this to, to push all of this forward and to help with that. So it will be a breakthrough point for links and links activities, and it will have a, a very strong impact on um, the types of scientific discussions that are going on in relationship to X-rays and neutrons in the country and electrons. I shouldn't forget electrons. We have electron people here as well. So, uh, so that's been that's sort of in, inspirational in a way, the, the, the concept at least of, of, a, of a center of excellence based at Lix. And um, we've also put in, uh, and this sort of relates more to the, the, the emphasis that we're placing on the on the younger people and, and on, on the next generation PIs and so on. We put in a co-fund application pretty much on the heels of the one that Selma Marik and other put other people put in for. Uh, called PRISMAS, which went in for PhD students. We put in a postdoc one uh, that went into uh, to, to the EU, whenever it went in, I can't remember, it was such a, blind, a blinding rush. Uh, uh, February, was it? Was it February? Yes, Marie so it went, Curie. Sorry, yes. Marie Curie. Yes, Marie Curie. So it went into uh, M MFCA um, uh, in, in February uh, with a, bit, a big rush and it was done very quickly, but rather well. I, again, I'd say in all modesty. And that is entitled to Advanced Multiscale Biological Imaging with European Research Infrastructures. It has uh, Leicester, EMBL, uh, Max4, ESS. It has, uh, uh, it has, it has a very strong um, uh, international and, and national participation, but, and, and it also has very strong clinical engagement as well. So we have real practicing clinicians who are involved in biomedical imaging and that is going to bring a whole postdoc cohort into existence and we're buzzing around Europe and within Sweden as well. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Martin has designed a, a, a frog here to represent, uh, I, I, I'm not sure what, we, we talked about this, right? But I think it was, it's a frog trapped in amber, right? Uh, something to do with imaging and the concept of imaging. Anyway, uh, I'm all for the frog. And uh, it's, uh, so, 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 I mean, I think it's, these things are very, difficult to get, competition is very high, but at least, um, as has been pointed out to me, if we don't get it, the European system is such that you get very structured uh, feedback. Am I going on too long? Yes, right. Okay, so, so uh, right, anyway, so Amber, and then this is some a graphical uh, representation of Amber hitting various aspects of biological imaging. And then lastly, I think, um, uh, we, we will be moving, I mean, the ink is not dry, as I keep telling everybody, but we will be moving on Science Village uh, within the next 18 months or so. Uh, we have two competing tenders in two possible places, the loop and, and space. Uh, these are various representations, the two representations of the two places. 
and that will give us extended space and it will give us uh, the capacity to be right next door to the facilities and to bring some of these things together very close to, to Max4 and, and ESS, which is exactly where we need to be as the village comes together and people move on to the site from within and all up within this area and from all over the country and from outside. And then lastly, uh, just uh, by way of telling you just to, from people to look out for and whom you can talk to during the day, um, and also to introduce Josephine Martel. Josephine is our new activities coordinator. She's sitting there controlling the computers at the moment. She, uh, we're very lucky to have Josephine. Uh, she's, she started in, in March and she is uh, actually, she's done a PhD in geophysics, if I, uh, uh, planetary geophysics, is that right? Geology. Right, planetary geology. Mm -hmm. And she's done neutron scattering and I, and you, I guess you've done some x-rays as well. Uh, and so she, she knows science, this type of science. She knows big facility science. She knows the types of problems that you deal with and the types of interactions that we need to see happening. And so we're very lucky to have her as an activities coordinator. And it's already having a strong impact on what, what we're doing. And these are some of the other people. Anna Danido is at the back here. She's our head of administration. And you'll find that she will be uh, uh, running around uh, trying to make you do all sorts of things, uh, so some of which you may want to do, uh, but uh, no, you'll, and, and, and it's been very, very good for us. And, and then we've got Nina and, and some other people, Martin uh, and um, Sebastian, Daniel, and you'll see them all over the place. So I'm just making you aware of these people so in case you, uh, you, you have questions and um, uh, want answers. So anyway, welcome. And I think what I'll do now is we can hand over to Anders, to say a few words on behalf of our board. And, uh, and then after that, we'll have Christian who'll say uh, a few words from, from the south. Okay. So um, my name is Anders Tundlid. I'm a vice dean at the science faculty. I'm also a professor in ecology. Uh, I don't have a strong background in, in X-ray or neutron science at all, uh, but um, Lynx uh, is um, hosted by the science faculty and uh, so we are in some way uh, responsible uh, for, for um, having the shared position. And in the shared there are also representatives from uh, the medical faculty, uh, the technical faculty, and from ESS, and Max Born, et cetera. Uh, we also have an external uh, member in the board. And um, I think Trevor had said a lot, lot of things that I could have mentioned here, but I will just to say a few things. You, one thing you missed here is that I was looking on this log here. I, I was thinking about what have we done in the board during the last year that has been a lot of discussions about. And one thing is that, um, if you know here, this is the Institute of Advanced Neutral and X-ray Science. It's not any longer the Institute of Advanced Neutral and X-ray Science. And you can understand it was quite a lot of discussion at the university if we are going to remove Lund there. And uh, the reason for doing this is that we wanted to uh, increase the visibility of, of uh, links. Uh, and we, it's not a Lund only activity, it's an activity for Sweden, for Europe, internationally. So, uh, I mean, that was a strategic uh, decision taken. Um, we have also, if I look back, uh, spent quite a lot of time discussing the movement to Science Village area. Uh, discussing different options for that and funding and, and budget for that. Uh, we also spend a lot of time discussing this new procedure for theme calls, which I think has come out very well. Um, and um, then also I think that um, we have discussed a little bit about how to promote the younger scientists' particip participation here in, in Leeds. I think that we should spend more effort in that. I think that's very important. Obviously, I'm, I'm approaching my, my retirement, so I think it's very important to have a young generation here and that can uh, bring things forward. Uh, so I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, the management and the staff, uh, Lynx, Trevor and his colleagues here, for really doing, uh, devoting a lot of time into Lynx, promoting the activities in a very stimulating way. Uh, I'm very positive to the development of these. It hasn't happened a lot since you've arrived here, Trevor. Uh, and also, um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so I wish you, you have a good day and very interesting, stimulating discussion. Thank you.
Thanks so much. Thank you very much also for your support and constructive criticism throughout the time I've been here and I'm sure before. Uh, right, Christiane, are you there? I just realized that uh, Christiane said that she is not able to connect. Oh. So we can continue we and then uh, we once we solve her problem. So we'll learn. continue into the session. Right? Yeah, can you see? So in that case, so, so the first session is going to be chaired jointly by Helmut Trova and Charlie Karras as the director, directors of the central facilities. And uh, so I'm not sure who I'm handing over to first. Oh, but, it's part the two of us yeah, yeah, but there's a double act going on here, which yes. I'm rather looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we thought was that we say 90 seconds, Charlie said, not more, where we stand respectively with our facilities. Uh, so uh, I, I start out, uh, ESS, we are, as you can imagine, focusing on rolling out the project. Uh, we're doing that at the moment very well in the sense that we hold our main deadlines. Uh, the first deadline that is coming up is what we call beam on target. That is when the accelerator shoots the protons on the, at the target wheel and produces neutrons. Uh, that is foreseen for, uh, at the moment, May 2025. And we're all working towards that. We have at the moment the commissioning of the uh, first part of the accelerator, which is normal conducting. Uh, it's fully in plan. Hope to finish that uh, before June uh, this year. Parallel, we install the cryo modules. The target wheel is tested. So lots of components coming together. Instruments are built up. And I think for this for this round, and Shravana will say more about that, but uh, since Shravana is there also, what we're doing, we're looking more at the science. Uh, so update of the science uh, uh, case. So I think this meeting is excellent input for for Toronto and, and, and all of us uh, in this context, uh, because there is in parallel also a little bit of planning what we should do in 25 when we have our first neutron and then do the commissioning, what we call first science, and then prepare for the user program. So that's uh, in a nutshell, hopefully that was 90 seconds, what's going on there. And if you need more uh, information and want to see it firsthand, contact any of us and we can arrange visits and you are extremely welcome. Excellent. Charlie, over to you. Thank you. So uh, quick update on Max 4. We are today a facility with 16 beam lines in operation, accepting about 1400 users every year. Uh, we expect to have a growing science program. Uh, much of the beamless are fairly new on the floor. We have commissioned two only last year that come into operation only 2023. So we do expect a significant growth of our user base in the coming years. Ongoing right now is, of course, if you are Swedish, you know that 2024 will be the year when the government presents the research bill. We are preparing to provide input for that, which for us will, to a large extent, deal with a continued build up of the facility. We hope that we will get enough money to continue to extend our beamline portfolio. We are fairly ambitious with about five beamlines the coming five years. So that will, of course, be a significant investment of primarily government funding. I now want to say something about the frog, because I think that was a leap of faith, wasn't it? To move out to Science Village. That was the idea, wasn't it? It was a big jump. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm extremely happy because uh, I have always been concerned that Science Village will be a marketplace for uh, commercial actors and there will be no science. And, and I think that links now dare to get out there is extremely important for a balanced development of that area. So I congratulate you on that daring move. I, I wanted to see that as a leap of faith. Also, that was the frog for me. So excellent. I think now we will have some updates from the facilities. So the first speaker is Joanna from- Maybe Before that, Christiane is down. The okay. Our, our chair, <laughs> she's there. So, oh, so let me unmute her, or I ask her to unmute. Or Can you please? <laughs> Chris, Christiane, are you there? Can you? Yes, uh, yes, I, I'm here and I first you, would like to deeply apologize because I click on, on the wrong Zoom meeting and so uh, I'm lost. I'm getting old, I think. So uh, 
Here, I just would like to speak on behalf of the SAB, which is a scientific advisory committee, and which since the beginning in 2017 helped the uh, Links Directorate in his activities. And we are really, really happy to see the, the new opportunities. And also we are happy to see so many attendees for this uh, Science Day at Links. And I think Links is really playing his role of hub and preparing the next generation for the use of neutron and, synchro and synchrotron. We uh, also have new theme uh, and the first international called who was very, which was very, very successful. You will hear this this morning. So I don't want to be too long, but I wish you a very, very pleasant day and I'm sure you will enjoy all the lectures. Thank you very much. And sorry for my late. Now back to the program. So uh, I guess you're now no longer new at work, Juliana. Uh, no, it's a little bit more than five months. Ex excellent. So <laughs> we decided that we uh, split the session in such that I chair the, the neutron speeches and uh, Helmut will chair the X-ray speeches. So please, I'll uh, start yelling after 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so thank you very, first of all very much for organizing this day. It's really, as I said, this is very important for us, very important for the facilities. And it's, it's especially important for me that I'm starting to embark in this process of seeing how to uh, make possible in the best way uh, science at TSS. Um, you, Helmut, has already uh, told you that we are uh, uh, expecting to have BIM on target in uh, mid-2025. BIM on target for us means uh, uh, first neutrons, uh, then we need a bit of time between uh, uh, the time we have BIM on target to when we can really uh, use properly these neutrons. And we expect to be, uh, by end of 2027, uh, ready to welcome our users. So the facility will have ramp up to the nominal power and we should be able to uh, welcome, uh, to have a, an official user program by the end of 2027. In between, um, so from a uh, few months after BIM on target, so as soon as we can see some neutrons on the neutron instruments uh, and for uh, uh, yeah, until uh, we welcome users, uh, we are going to commission our instruments and we are going to uh, produce what we call uh, first science. And I want to uh, tell you a little bit now where, where we are in uh, this process uh, uh, now. I forget about everything that is happening to uh, bring the beam on target, which is huge, as Edmund said, so building this uh, beautiful accelerator and uh, this uh, impressive target wheel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will uh, really concentrate on the main uh, uh, aim of the facility that is to uh, do science with uh, neutron scattering from the uh, neutron instruments. Uh, what are these instruments? Very briefly, we foresee to have by, um, by end of 2028, uh, 15 uh, in instruments uh, running including uh, diffractometers, uh, large scale structure instruments uh, like small angle scattering machines and reflectometers. Uh, we uh, have an imaging instrument and actually the, uh, our uh, um, scientists from imaging is involved with Trevor uh, in this co uh, application. Uh, we have an instrument for engineering diffraction an instrument for macromolecular uh, crystallography and MX, and a number of spectrom uh, spectrometers to look at the dynamics uh, of, of matter. So uh, all these others uh, would concentrate mostly on our structures uh, and we have a number of instruments to look at dynamics. I won't go through uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what this instrument lo look like, but I want to well, show first a little bit of the timeline for uh, uh, them coming online, and then show to you a few pictures uh, to, to, to tell you what's the progress uh, at the moment. 
So we expect to uh, have uh, ready uh, for uh, demon targets, so ready for commissioning uh, at least six instruments, so including a, a diffractometer, a dream, a small angle scattering machine, LOTI, uh, imaging, ODIN, um, bifrost and C-spec spectrometers, and the detectometer STR. And then uh, um, afterwards, uh, and uh, until, uh, as I said, mid of 2028, uh, the other ones will come online. Um, these are uh, yeah, what's being built now. Uh, the original uh, uh, scope of the uh, facility is to be able to go up to 22 instruments by 2035. And we are in the process now of discussing with our advisory board. So they discussed it last, uh, last week with our scientific advisory uh, committee, uh, ways to go forward uh, and uh, go ahead with building additional instruments. Clearly our priority at the moment is to concentrate on those that are being built. So, uh, but we, we, we need to, to look at the future, we've learned that it takes time uh, from when uh, you decide what instrument to build to when you actually realize it. So we shouldn't be uh, uh, too late. And here, just some recent uh, of pictures of uh, work going on at the moment in, uh, the, in the guidos. Uh, and uh, things that are being uh, assembled uh, on all uh, uh, the parts of the uh, beam line uh, starting from uh, uh, parts in, in, inside the bunker area, so neutron optics and uh, shutters. Um, a few instruments have already their uh, neutron optics guide uh, uh, installed. Uh, some instruments uh, have detector uh, uh, fans um, ready. And that's to continue with our target field has been uh, uh, the given, which uh, made the PSS uh, be bow. Uh, moderator uh, is also uh, there. So there is a huge activity going on. If you come and visit uh, every day, so there's something, something different. But I've been, I've been doing visits with different people in the last few months. And in uh, five months, it's, it's enormous what's been uh, uh, happening over there. Um, and concerning instruments, yeah, that's uh, we have Loki, uh, that is one of those that is going to be ready first, so that has um, quite a lot of components already uh, present. So the same for uh, uh, Dream, the, the diffractometer. Um, yeah, this is just an invitation for you to come and see us. I, I don't want to go into any details, and that's what looks like uh, at the moment uh, this guide also where the instruments uh, will be uh, sitting. Uh, besides that, there's activity going on for uh, sample environment. So we have uh, very recently gone through a small reorganization inside our uh, support uh, facility for preparing samples and for making uh, um, experiments. And so we, we have uh, two uh, support groups and materials uh, and physics support that provide sample environment systems for uh, uh, users uh, uh, that work at very low, very high temperatures. So magnetic uh, uh, systems, electrical fields, high pressure. Uh, and very recently, our polarization uh, activities have been included into uh, this group. Uh, and yeah, provide sample environment system control integration for complex systems and mechanical uh, integration. Uh, we have also a stress rig that we received only a few weeks ago. And then we have a group uh, um, for chemistry and life science support. And this includes not only sample environment for uh, soft matter and biological uh, uh, samples, uh, but also support uh, uh, laboratories, so both classical support laboratories uh, nearby the beam lines in our chemistry, but also a very important deterioration uh, uh, service. We have a rather active, uh, I mean, an activity that has been uh, growing uh, rather uh, fast and successful, now uh, allowing both chemical deterioration and uh, biological deterioration that is hosted. Uh, uh, within the University of Lund at the moment, 
part of it will move uh, to uh, the ESS site uh, soon and part will, uh, will stay in, uh, in uh, doing. Uh, quite a lot of progress over there as well. We do have already a number of items, but uh, still uh, work is uh, going on to well uh, interact with the instrument teams and make sure that uh, we have what we need uh, for our uh, first science. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, we have a uh, data management and software center, another uh, successful uh, support uh, activity for ESS. It is based in uh, Denmark, so sometimes a bit challenging on the practical uh, side, uh, but so far and with a wide mission that goes from uh, working on uh, um, with the user, uh, uh, I mean, making the web interface for a, a proposal a submission uh, to uh, instrument control, sample environment control, data acquisition, uh, storage, visualization, data reduction, and with the ambition uh, to um, tackle then a more complex uh, uh, software uh, um, uh, I mean, to give computational, more advanced computational uh, uh, support. So besides data analysis uh, uh, help that is well underway at the moment, uh, we aim at uh, uh, doing modeling simulation and uh, um, interaction, interactions with the theory. Um, as I said, this is in uh, Copenhagen and we'll uh, soon uh, move from uh, uh, its premises uh, to go uh, to some, some other place. Um, although we have not really started as a uh, Newton facility, there is already <coughs> quite a lot of uh, scientific activity going on. And very recently, we had a survey of the people uh, of, of scientists uh, related doing science for ESS. Uh, so scientists uh, that are uh, what, the classical instrument scientists, uh, support facility scientists, like uh, uh, scientists in the laboratories in sample environment software, uh, detector, accelerator, target, as well as uh, uh, people who are uh, um, working uh, for us in kind. And uh, yeah, from this survey, we, we could count 74 people that are already uh, doing science uh, for uh, ESS. And I want to give you a flavor of the, what, what are the activities of this kind of people. So we have selected with the, um, but that, that's uh, yeah, the publications, uh, uh, the PLL is already, uh, not PLL, sorry. The PSS <laughs> is already <laughs> producing, uh, fun maps is not enough, is it? Uh, <laughs> but compared to 25 years, I mean, so a yeah, small fraction. Um, so ESS is actively, uh, uh, actively publishing scientific research, uh, both uh, technical uh, uh, research and scientific publications. Uh, and as you see, it's been uh, uh, going up and um, in a coffee time we can discuss about uh, uh, this part if you want, uh, in collaborations with a large number of countries, mainly in uh, Europe, but also in uh, other parts of the world. And I picked up with our uh, user office responsible, Karina Lovely, a few examples of uh, of a, um, science that's been published in the last couple of months from uh, different kind of scientific, scientific profiles of the PSS. So uh, I didn't pick this up, it was picked up by her. So the first example is a uh, work done by a postdoc, Sophie uh, Edward, which I believe is in uh, uh, the audience uh, in, collaborator, uh, in collaborations with uh, colleagues from uh, ISIS. Uh, to produce uh, a, a model membrane system uh, uh, useful for uh, work with uh, reflectometry techniques. So reflectometry techniques would give you information at a near ranks from a uh, scale of the structure of um, layers at interfaces. And what is interesting about this uh, uh, system is the uh, possibility to form a planet by layer uh, rather uh, free uh, to fluctuate far from uh, a solid substrate, which would be the typical way we work with this system. 
And uh, uh, that, but you can look uh, at interactive producing, you can see it on uh, liquid surfaces and uh, uh, capable of uh, allowing inter looking at interaction of material that can be proteins, uh, drugs, uh, um, you name it, uh, uh, with a layer and get such uh, information at the Angstrom scale. Uh, so that's soft matter uh, research from uh, uh, one of our postdocs. Uh, this is uh, a work uh, example from uh, hard matter uh, research from an instrument scientist, uh, Rasmus uh, uh, Peterson is the instrument responsible of, of Bifrost um, and is uh, an in kind of offer from uh, DTU in uh, Copenhagen. And he's been uh, looking at the structure uh, as well as uh, uh, magnetic um, uh, excitations uh, uh, of an antiferromagnet. Uh, so this is the composition that contains a different uh, amounts of ethereum and erbium. And they've been uh, looking at how uh, these different concentrations of ethereum and erbium would influence the magnetic structure. Uh, magnetic uh, uh, transition uh, as well as uh, uh, magnetic uh, excitations. And that's been uh, yeah, published in a piece uh, so very uh, recently. As I said, we have scientists also in uh, our technical services, and in particular, there is quite a bit of activity going on uh, in the, uh, with our detectors in the detector group. We're going to have a facility with a very high flux. Uh, this has uh, required uh, really a deep force so on how to be able to detect all these neutrons that are going to be uh, produced. And uh, th this is a work that has been done by, uh, again, uh, 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 people in uh, the detector group in collaboration with uh, uh, many other uh, people from other uh, facilities on uh, silicon-based uh, uh, detectors uh, and methods to increase the detection uh, efficiency. Um, the MSC, computational science, uh, there, there's a number of data scientists, what we call data scientists uh, over there. So uh, scientists that, so among other things, are also helping us uh, developing software uh, for uh, data analysis uh, to uh, offer uh, uh, user and uh, yeah, one of uh, uh, here we have this other recent paper from Andy McCluskey and uh, Wojciech Kostkowski in collaboration with Tom Arnold, that is one of our uh, instrument scientists, and many other people on uh, uh, Bayesian analysis of way of uh, using uh, best, I mean, best practices for uh, reporting a uh, Bayesian analysis for a neutron reflectometry um, data analysis in this uh, particular uh, case. And Andrew is really very active and he is uh, already produced a really nice uh, uh, suite for uh, uh, analysis of neutron reflectometry data. And finally, I won't say very much because it's really beyond my uh, <clears throat> expertise, but there's a very, very active uh, uh, scientific activities going around the uh, accelerator technology. If you see in all the other papers uh, that I showed to you, there were one, two, or three ESS scientists uh, and a uh, uh, large number of people from somewhere else. Uh, in this particular case, in with the ESS scientists are in our board. Uh, here we have really a, a, I mean, it's work done at ESS. So this is uh, on uh, um, components of the accelerator and the cell studies on accelerator technology. Um, okay, so that, that's just to give you an overview of the breadth of scientific activities going on now. Uh, what we also have, uh, uh, and as I said, we are, we, we are, uh, uh, contributed to the grant application from uh, Trevor, but the, 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 there are uh, grants uh, uh, that have been uh, awarded uh, and going on uh, already. And uh, this is a uh, uh, work that has been done uh, in, in collaboration with uh, Hannah Bakin, uh, who is in, uh, uh, works in the uh, duration uh, um, labs at the moment, uh, in, but at the moment in this chemistry and life science uh, support group, uh, who has uh, grants uh, um, uh, in progress uh, to look at uh, uh, 
working on the reconstitution of, <laughs> of model membranes and the layers. It is uh, our main uh, uh, activity, but looking at interactions of these uh, model membranes, uh, either uh, models of uh, cancer cell membranes or mitochondrial membranes. Uh, with molecules uh, uh, helping uh, to understand mechanism, uh, mechanisms of uh, cancer and collaborating uh, uh, with a number of people. Um, we have, we have Maggie uh, Skepo, uh, there are uh, Dovner, uh, Luke from uh, uh, ISIS uh, and then. Okay. Uh, um, um, I have just two slides, so okay. we have <laughs> all uh, this, but what we are doing at the moment, so we are uh, uh, repeating a benchmarking exercise of our instruments and uh, instrument gap analysis in a view of, uh, uh, of looking at what to do next, uh, looking at how to involve uh, the people that have been building these instruments uh, in our uh, first science. Uh, updating our uh, science case that uh, was written several years ago and uh, brainstorming it in, uh, internally uh, to see, yeah, like for, for this uh, update. So very, very quickly, I, these are slides from uh, Hannah presented at the scientist meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, we already uh, contribute for in uh, life science uh, uh, to um, many of the current challenges uh, with work that we already can do on extracellular vesicles or uh, uh, are shown uh, the collaborations for uh, cancer research, um, antimicrobial peptides, Alzheimer uh, peptides and so on. And with our smaller samples, higher throughput duration, there are ideas uh, to uh, contribute uh, uh, in the future in a uh, uh, much more effective way. And I thank you for your attention. Introduce you. We will hear about physical sciences from you at Mexico. So, who is you? Really should be gently when you're done. With yeah, this. I'll try <laughs> to. Okay. Um, little of, of flash forward when you think about it. You're not going to hear about construction because I'm going to echo with what Charlie said. Max4 is actually just done with actually the big first phase of construction. The machine is done, it's working, and technically all the demands are getting their first users easier, which for us is a huge milestone. We will use the same thing in a couple of years. But then obviously we do, we're not going to stop there. Similarly to what you're already doing, maybe ahead of us actually, already thinking about what you will do about next, in your next generation of instruments. Similarly, we do the same thing. And you're from Charlie, big visionary thing, maybe five demand in the pipeline within the next five years. So at some point, I mean, what you're going to see in this is pretty much no construction and what are we doing because we're done with that phase, mostly about what is starting to come out of the instrument because we're in that phase or we're finally getting on track on science and generating results and results and results. But still, for those of you who are not completely familiar, let's call it with Max4 in general, we're a bit special and just for that, it's deserving two or three minutes. First, we're not one light source, we're three light sources. And that's actually unique in the world. We have a big ring, a small ring, and a short pulse facility. For today's, I'm not going to talk about the short pulse facility, but just think about it. We are a unique facility where we have two storage rings. And it matters, and it matters why. It matters about the type of ring you have. It's pretty much dictating the kind of scientific opportunities you can have. And some people, way before my time and our times, were visionary in allowing to get two rings out of Max 4. And the best way of looking at it is to have a look on the way accelerator physicist thinks about that. So what you see, uh, like a small, Yes. On that plot is one way of characterizing the size of the machine. That's the x-axis. We take the diameter, the circumference of whichever number connected to that. And the number everyone is talking about is what we call the emittance. You don't need to be an expert, but long story short, if you want to know how to read that graph, the more you're on the left, the more soft x-rays you're going to get. The more you're on the right, the more hard x-rays you're going to get. And obviously, the kind of x-rays is going to detect the kind of science you can touch. And then these arrows, which are going down, which are going against, um, namely the, the, the emittance, and your small emittance is giving you more coherence and more brilliance. Technically, it's not really more photons, it's more quality photons. And the way you can use it, and the way you can manipulate it, and the way you can develop new science opportunities out of it. Then on the left hand side, you have the parameter for the small ring, 1.5 GeV, and, and the big ring. And so, because we have two rings, we have two spots on, in this graph. You have the max four three JV ring, which is when you think about it, right in the middle of the graph, and there is some, some reason behind it. And you have the small ring, which we tend to forget. 
Then you can have, okay, you just told us we got two rings, we're better than anyone. Now, actually, it's good to have a look to what the others are doing. All the orange points are the existing light source in the world. That is the big ones. And what you can see is that the 3 JV ring, is, the 1.5 JV ring is pretty much alone on one side. So strategically, if you think about it and you follow what I just said, it should be a great source of X-rays for very soft X-rays. And obviously, the trust three should not be a source for that stuff, for that part. But that's actually, that source is going to be extremely good at it. You got the whole thing of, of multiple sources. And obviously, these ones, maybe the three biggest ones, or maybe have four, that was three, spring eight, APS, and SRS, has the big monsters, the ones which are the gigantic ones, but as well as the ones which are the most expensive. A little bit of history. Why is Max4 interesting? Well, first thing, it's not feeding within the, the yellow dots, the yellow clouds, or whatever. And it's because of something which happened. It looked disruptive technology, the creation of an MBA lattice. Long story short, a beautiful way of, of developing engineering in a way which was not possible before. I'm going to be honest, I was among the people, part of the yellow dot saying, it's never going to work, not going to happen. I was wrong, it was demonstrated, and it's here. It's so disruptive that pretty much any of these orange points are thinking about getting the same thing of what happened in Lund, namely a greater machine to be able to catch up with us. Now you're kind of, well, you just told us you were amazing, you were beautiful, and you were world leading, but now you're telling us that you are just uh, in the middle of a cloud, you're pretty much on top of that cloud. Well, the reality is a bit different. Until the end of the decade, it's pretty much us, the SRF, and Sirius. The other ones are going to try to catch up. And what you heard, for example, from Giovanna, is taking time to first upgrade the rings and commissioning it, and then making sure we are being managing going to be online. Long story short, until the end of the decade, especially in Northern Europe, and for that type of machine, which has intermediate energy range, which means good for soft and hard x -ray. we're pretty much unique on the market. And that's where I look at it as a scientific director and for Sweden, huge scientific opportunity for Europe and as well as the Nordic countries in exploding that kind of source. That's Max 4 in a nutshell. Why is it so good? Why is it so special? Why it happened in London? And why we changed the world? More propaganda. <laughs> At the end of the day, you can have a beautiful source. If you don't have the right demand, the right staff, the right equipment, it's not going to work. So if you think about it, I told you, we have three sources, we have a bunch of demand, big number for us with finally 16 demand, which is a small number, of it, which is actually a large number. Um, but um, and the beauty of it is that because they are scattered on both rings, you can cover a huge energy range, pretty much from 4 EV, so almost deep DUV, down to a hard X-ray range, kind of 35, 40 KV. And so depending on what you want to do, the kind of science you want to do, you can dedicate a beam mind to do one of these. You got the whole list of all of them. Obviously, if you're interested in soft X-ray, that's a king thing for looking at surfaces and looking at chemistry. If you go for hard X-ray, you go deep, you go in the bulk, and you do this, this kind of thing. But that's kind of unique. Um, to be honest, the fact that we have two ring means that this beam line could be built. If you have only one, these ones would have not been happening, the one on top. And if you will have only the small ring, all these ones on that side would be not existing. But that's why that's a big advantage of it. Long story short as well, if you want to know which beamline is the best thing, the best thing to, to do is not to listen to me. If you go on our website, you have the list of beamline, you can pick a brief description, either per technique, per scientific area. Have a look to the website, always the best resource if you want to submit a proposal and know. And remember rule number one, successful proposal, talk to your beamline scientists first, or it's not gonna happen. Usually it's uh, the number one advice. But as you heard from Charlie, something which is important, so 16 beamline fully in operation, but technically, uh, we have room for expansion. If we are barely thinking outside of the box, we can do 10. If you push it a little bit, you can do 14 more. And have some crazy ideas, we may be able to do 10 even more out of that. But so we are starting intensively to look into the future on how we make that happen. Similar exercise to what you mentioned, you know, gap analysis of our instrument. It's something that we're starting to work on. We're something special um, that SPF thing, which is connected here, technically could be used as a, as a startup for building a free laser if we decide to do so in the future. But that's what it is. Similarly, website, we have, and I wish you the same thing that they assess, we have a beautiful scientific annual report. That's the best way of being finding your favorite science. It's on the website, you go on the Max4 website, there's some CL science report, you get in there, you have details and beautiful things about what we do at Max4. And that thing is getting bigger and bigger every year, and we're very proud of it. Uh, so go and have a look at it. But now, a little bit of science with the leftover that I have of time. So physical science, is that weird area where it's physics, it's chemistry, it's not physics, it's not chemistry, it's in the boundary of everything. I did pretty much my career in soft matter. So we're really in the middle, depending on who you talk, they think you're a chemist or a scientist or a physicist. But I'm gonna take a, 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 a leap of stage that's actually in, in the way I'm gonna describe it. That description is my own way of describing for soft matter, for example, the way physical science and what it's important to do, that structure and dynamics and things like that. 
Technically, you could take the same thing, change a little bit, put left sign behind it, it would be about the same. At the end of the day, you have a phase diagram or a system and you try to understand it. You have various variables, the concentration, pressure, temperature, uh, reactivity or whatever you name it. And because we're scientists, we, understand, we have to understand that. What we understand more and more is that if you really, really need to understand how the system works, just looking at it at a specific scale and at a specific time scale is not gonna cut it. You need a set of, let's say, different vision goggles to have a look at your system and the relevant length scales. And that applies pretty much to everything. The beauty of X-rays, neutron, and electron, remember that um, thing we talked to the Norwegians, that microscope, these beautiful tools we have, they're nothing as a gigantic microscope allowing you to, have to go with a certain level of um, field of view and resolution in matter in general, and have a look to either the static or the dynamics. You have no mystery. You have three big ways of using X-rays, whether whatever science you do. You can do imaging, you can do scattering and diffraction, you can do spectroscopy. There are not one which is more powerful than any other one. It's just depending on what you look at, that's what you do. Um, because of our 1.5 JV ring, we are an outstanding source for doing any kind of form of flavors of X-ray photo emission. That's really something which is typical for some soft X-ray and which is very powerful. So I'm going to give you a, a bunch of examples. What Max was extremely good at is to develop a very strong program which resonates with the northern country, by the way, in ambient pressure XPS. At the end of the day, it's really looking at the fine details of the chemistry of interfaces when the chemistry happens. Usually you would do that, you have a sample and you look at it that, in that given condition. The challenge now is the world is a dynamic <coughs> variable. Namely, we, with the world we, we all hear about if we want to be trendy in the sea control world is going to be operando in situ. Uh, nano, we start to be over it, but, uh, but operando in situ are the two big ones. Namely, the world is understanding that just studying a model system does not cut it anymore. We want to look, if you look at catalysis, you want to look at catalysis exactly the way it happens at the industry or in your car. <coughs> And so if you want to be competitive, we need to be able to reproduce what you do in your car or in your industry at the same temperature. And it's not going to be easy. That's where sample environments are getting important, 800 degrees, that kind of pressure and whatever, because that's where it matters. And usually when you start to do that, when you do real life experiments, well, they're not static. Everything moves, everything changes, the temperature is evolving. So the component is time resolved, what you're going to hear on all light source and as well as prediction control source, obviously, time is always a future, looking at the way things are moving at a specific time. In that case, we can do what Beamline Hippie in that case, I've been developing crazy and really exciting tools of we're doing time resolve uh, ambient pressure XPS in a unique way. It's almost kind of control, but in an interesting way. If you want to know, contact Andre Shavarsky. Um, in a more classical way, and it's very relevant for Lund, where we're currently discussing in response to the European CHIP Act and eventually reactivating the brain of bringing back semiconductor technology back in Europe. So there was historically a strong effort around here, Ericsson, Sony, whatever you name it, in developing um, you know, semiconductor technology. At the core of it, if you want to do a good processor, are interfaces between material. You don't need to be an expert about the way they work, but in the end, it's layering things. It's like making, my father was a chef, it's like making a, a beautiful layered cake. You put a layer of something, another layer of something, and if you don't pay attention to the fine details, the source can go in between the, the various layers and not stay where it needs. And at the end of the day, the performance of your devices really depend on the quality of these interfaces. Very complex solid state chemistry and looking at the interfaces. For that, you want to do photoelectron spectroscopy. Something interesting. I did not know it existed before I come to Maxwell. We have a strong program, which is a specialty from Estonia. And remember, we resonate with the Nordic area. In photoluminescence, you can aware is that. Easy, you put X-rays on a material and it's generating visible light. You know, kind of what's the point? Simple. That actually is the basis of any detector in uh, medical imaging. Then if, if you think about it, a scintillator. And you would think it's done. Actually, it's not done. There is a huge level of research making them better, cheaper, more efficient and eventually smarter down to the type of um, uh, X-ray you would have, eventually could be converted not only on only one uh, visible wavelength, but two, and maybe get information because of the direction of things like that. Extremely relevant, tons of paper coming out of it. And it's something from Estonia. But something we can really do, actually, in a good way. Um, something more standard, um, connected a little bit with soft matter. We have a beautiful stick stem scanning X-ray transmission microscopy. And what you can do in that case, and that's the beauty of it, you can have a look to Carbon edge. And for those of you who have been trying to do this, experiment, it's extremely hard because the problem is carbon is everywhere. So if you want to look at carbon, you need to distinguish carbon from the beam line, from the dirt, from everywhere, from your sample. In that case, you have a sample 
you look at the chemistry of carbon, and carbon, for example, in that case, could be in the form of styrene, it could be on polyurethane, or it could be on uh, uh, amorphous matrix. And what you can do is that you use scanning X-ray transmission microscopy, and you do high-level chemistry. You are really able on the sample with nanometric resolution to identify which parts are coming from which part of the component. Very quick, you can do the same thing in the hard X-ray regime, but at the moment you do there, it's no longer carbon. You deal with heavy element. Something relevant for the very north of, uh, of Sweden, uh, mining industry. At some point, when you want to extract rare earths, we talk about these things, or type of metals, especially with the new discovery of having tons of lithium and whatever else. Um, what matters is for the mining industry is, okay, I got my piece of stone, but they want chemically to extract actually, for example, let's say bismuth. And the problem is depending on the way bismuth is mixed up with everything around it, it's gonna complicate the extraction of it. In that case, they are doing complete mapping of that piece of ore, focusing on bismuth, but looking at all the other actually elements to try to identify in that specific field in which they are getting the stones, what are the things I'm going to need to get rid of or purify and things like that? Imaging, imaging, imaging. The world is going to be focusing on imaging. So no mystery, we're going to do tomography. Um, the challenge, and I keep saying it, careful, beautiful imaging needs to be analyzed. Quantitative imaging is actually the key. If it's just having a beautiful image, how do you say, oh, I see holes or whatever, it's not going to cut it, and we should be careful not to have a flap. We need quantitative data out of it, which is important. They are really interested in nanoparticles, as much as it has been in terms of the world, but still fundamentally important for nanotechnologies. You can do small angle. You have one of the best instruments of the hill. And that one, I don't know if my movie is going to work. No, it's going to, it was my last slide, but it's going to uh, kill my cliffhanger. Something very interesting, we did our beam line Danmax. It's called on trip steel. And you're kind of, what the heck is that? It's actually an interesting metal where because of a phase transformation that the physics is talking, which is happening if you, if you apply a mechanical stress on it, one effect would be you prove on it or you compress it, and you do that with x-rays. The whole goal is try to understand better steel, and you are kind of why. I took this picture last night out of the website of Volvo. I took a Swedish car maker. Uh, I took the XC90 because I think it's a cute one. And you can find on all these things, all these weird parts describing actually the, the shape of the car. You would not imagine, and by the way, I'm preparing for a meeting with Volvo next week, so that's why I'm doing it. That is not completely free. But um, the key of all these different color schemes is there is a lot of engineering in trying to control and predict the way these type of steel are going to be compacted or pulled out when you have a car, a car crash. That's why, that's why I wanted to use my computer. Then you will have the movie, the car crash coming from all sides. Yeah, wait, let me see if I can just turn it on. But I think, oh, yeah. I think it may work, I don't know. Is it on the car? Or? Yeah, no, on that one. You're running it's out a YouTube video. No, it's not working. <laughs> 15. Anyway, that's where, for example, it's really, uh, really relevant, actually. And that's the kind of research you can do where, obviously, it's important not only to do research, but as well to communicate, especially is how much we impact, impact we can have. Car, it's easy. Saving lives behind. Yeah. Next speaker, Selma, is replacing Marjorie because okay. I think she's not so well. So uh, we are now looking forward to hearing about life science at uh, Max 4. Thank you. Shall I stand in the middle? So Mario Lane sent me some of her slides in Keynote. That's why I'm using my own computer. I've never used Keynote. So I hope it works. And uh, thank you so much, Ingrid, for the nice introduction. I don't have to talk about Max 4 at all. I just focus on the opportunities within the life sciences. And I, I know many of you here, and uh, I think um, most of the time I've stood up here, I've been talking about food science, but today I will give you a broader overview of what we can do at Max4. And uh, you're looking, of course, you can see the fly yeah. up there that I've shown many, many times uh, within my group. But it, as Amrick said, we have many different techniques that we can use uh, that we divide into spectroscopy, scattering, and imaging. And these are just uh, some of the examples of the information that you can get from using x-rays in, in this way. So using spectroscopic method, we can look at the electronic and chemical, we can take chemical information from um, various uh, tissue or, or plants. That's where we would like to move, uh, move towards. Uh, most of you are familiar with the crystallography <coughs> and the protein structures that we've been able to obtain. This has been revolutionary for the pharma industry, of course, and for drug development. I'm showing you some of my old, very, very old data uh, uh, that is actually LDL particles that were extracted from three healthy males from Skåne, from this region, uh, that we were doing 
uh, mapping how fat is actually packed in those. And we used first x-ray, these are x-ray data on our, actually on a lab source. But then when we went into patients, we got a pool of a thousand patients uh, who had had atherosclerosis, then we did not have as much sample as from healthy people. So we had to go to synchrotron to, to do those measurements. And later on, we also coupled it with neutron. We have a lot of other examples. Uh, we've had collaborations with Tetra Pak looking at uh, different types of polymers, uh, scanning sacs using one bone. And uh, these are just examples of uh, looking at uh, human nerves. And up in the corner here, I don't know if I can actually play it. Uh, this was something that was done in collaboration with Links. This is Jesper Harholt from uh, Carlsberg um, Laboratory. This is imaging that they are using in their brewing process. So they actually do a lot of uh, imaging when they develop their product. And this, uh, uh, this study here actually of uh, mapping um, metal distribution in, in Arabidopsis bariana was done in collaboration uh, with Carlsberg. And these were some of the first experiments that were done at Nanomax. Uh, max four. So I was trying to uh, look at all the techniques that we have at max four and uh, just to showcase which ones because we have now we have 16 instruments we can of course build more but uh, which ones can we are relevant for the life sciences and they are quite a lot you can see that there are fewer that are not relevant and also I the, the ones that are, are kind of shaded are not very relevant but even on the team, we've already done. Tommy, you tried to do some starch particles already yeah. on it, yes, and we've done some bone. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities, but it also depends. It's not just about building the V1, it's also about uh, how we do the, the sample preparation, sample handling, and, and data analysis, which will be my key message today. So we have a suit of instruments, and many of them are relevant for the, for the life sciences. Of course, we have structural biology, which is our biggest user base. And we, there we have the uh, MX beamlines with Biomax, that was one of our first beamlines that came up. Uh, Micromax, that is now open for, for general use. And of course, small and scattering here. We'll look at, I believe this is a nano disk because I spent a lot of my PhD work on that system exactly. So I think it's coming from, from Denmark. Now, uh, Biomax has been up and running for many years. Uh, it's a workhorse for crystallography. These days, you don't even have to come to us. You send the samples automated, uh, and uh, you can be anywhere in the world and collect your data at Max4. And this was also one of the beam lines that was up and running during the COVID times. Um, uh, we have very high throughput, high capacity there. We can do crystal screening, phasing all types of different uh, uh, screening and selection. So I'm not gonna go into uh, the details of the, all of this is also on our website. What is interesting there is of course that we have the Fragmax platform. I want to uh, make a push. Uh, this is being led by Tob Tobias Kreyer. And I think it's currently also leading to a, a new collaboration with, uh, with Salife Lab where we are introducing and analyzing binding of different fragments uh, and we can identify binding sites and this is it can be accessed through Max4 and also through the INEX discovery. And it's a big collaboration between many different partners. So you can access many libraries that we have in the, in the network, but also bring your own. <clears throat> and this is also very relevant. And there's quite a lot of uh, interest from the industry. So this, this project was enabled by a grant from the Swedish Research Council. But without, I don't have that much time because I want to make a point at the end. So I would like to uh, just point you towards our website where we have a lot of uh, publications and science cases that are coming out of all the beamlines. Hmm. Let me see if I can do. We also have Micromax beamline that has been in commissioning since the fall and now it's open for general use where uh, which is funded by the Novo Nordisk Foundation, where we will be able to do uh, serial crystallography, crystallography and uh, time resolved experiments and a lot of high throughput uh, uh, data collection. So it is currently uh, open for actually no more use. So this is one of our, our final beamlines that has been, that has now come up. Now, small angle scattering, of course, you heard already from AIMRIC, it's useful in, in, in physics in many different fields. Uh, these are just some applications that you can do in uh, life science, a lot of examples that are also before COSAC's time. And uh, it's a 
also a complementary technique to, to crystallography where you can look at your proteins in solution and then you can also affect it in different ways. Uh, and uh, with the power that we have at Max4 is also, it gives us an opportunity to really do high throughput. And I already showed you an example of cholesterol particles that are very important for our, our health that we could do high throughput uh, on a synchrotron. And if we want to really move towards creating this benefit for society, we need to really think in those terms, how can we enable hospitals and, and other sectors to, to use this. So with small angle scattering, one of my favorite techniques, because that's what I did for my PhD, uh, you can do a lot of structure dynamics and look at really molecular complexes, bigger molecules, and it's been quite useful now with the uh, lipid nanoparticle development of the vaccines. And a lot of that work was done at this, uh, at this in Hamburg. Uh, I'm showing some, this uh, actually combination is also some of my data, stuff that I did when I was still doing science. And uh, this was a co uh, combination of small angle X-ray and neutron scattering where we can look at membrane proteins that are actually 80% of all drug targets today, which are very difficult to do. Uh, uh, using crystallography, so we use a combination of, of neutrons and X-rays. And this uh, post-axial oh, line is very, very relevant for those types of uh, experiments, especially for, uh, for protein. And now, this is just a slide on the sample environments that <clears throat> are, I think all of them are currently available, where you can do uh, static sand, uh, SACs, and uh, we have a multi-probe uh, multi uh, where you can do different types of measurements on the same sample uh, at the same time. And we also have a sample environment to do microfluidics if you are interested in that. But I also have to say, I have to do a push for links, which we've been working really hard with, uh, or it's been quite a lot of fun where we've been working with the Northern Lights on Food team, where we can now see a lot of the, the, the experiments that are coming to COSAX are actually coming from the food science field. And these are just examples from the food industry that have been using the the bee mind in, in their development. So you can uh, you can read about that on the website. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but we also can use spectroscopic, spectroscopic methods in, um, in life science. We can, of course, uh, use spectroscopy to look at many of our uh, molecules in our body. You have metal centers, uh, proteins have metal centers. So uh, it's been quite useful for that. We can look at uh, element distribution in the environment, life science is, uh, of course, uh, broader than just drug development. And we can uh, look at elemental distribution in a cellular context. And this is really where, where uh, we think opportunities lie. Some examples from, from Balde, where we have been looking at, or our users have been looking at uh, different metals in uh, proteins, this was done for serial crystallography, but also just still looking at proteins in, in um, uh, for electro microbiology, and also just uh, looking at iron in uh, lake sediments. So it's extremely broad. This is Valde. When we did the PhD, we developed a PhD program that we just got co-financing from the EU for. And when we opened it up for a call, most of the um, um, uh, proposals actually came uh, for the Balder Beam So this is a, a really uh, a beam that you can use in many different areas of science. And it's an elegant probe for, for different element speciation in biological and environmental samples. Also a lot of fossil work. See, can I move forward? Uh, yes, we have Nanomax and Softimax, which are very, very relevant for the life sciences. And we've seen uh, nice, um, examples coming from mapping uh, plant tissue and also mapping other tissues that I will show, but I would like to flag that it could be more used in the life sciences. And this also, especially on the, on the stick them, on the softy, uh, on the softy max, because there we really need to work with how we prepare the samples and also with the data analysis afterwards. Uh, where well, we really need to start thinking about standardization in terms of how crystallography has done it. But if we really want to make these breakthroughs, we do not have 60 years that it took for crystallography. So uh, a lot of science is already coming out and we can uh, look at that. I want to also just mention a little bit about imaging. We have uh, imaging beamlines or beamlines that have imaging capabilities that are coming up with the with the 4MAX and also later on we'll have it with Danmax, but we really do want to 
in the future build a specific a flagship one for the life sciences so we can do uh, uh, breakthrough science um, and just a little bit on formax because it's just now up and we we are currently in commissioning and we're this is a, a very nice line also for the food science uh, which has been financed through through Wallenberg and the uh, uh, wood forestry industry uh, which can do um, tax wax and imaging so we can really uh, look at a, a range of length scales so from uh, nanocellulose to you know doing microscopic studies with the, with the imaging we are not yet there with the imaging i'm trying with currently commissioning but we've done some first experiments this was the uh, scanning sac uh, wax experiments on nanomaterials and we also had our first industry experiment on uh from tetra Pak, where they were uh, really using this in their uh, development of the paper straws and this is also led i think they have five uh, ct scanners at in their uh, R&D right now. So uh, it's also uh, helping um, uh, in developing these, <coughs> how do you say in-state media, gateway environments and lab sources. Now, we, I already mentioned, we would like to build a flagship imaging beamline for the life sciences where we, it's a, a beamline that we, uh, it's one of our highest priorities right now, which will be um, a dedicated full field tomography beamline and where we can exploit the, the brilliance and coherence from max score. And it would give us a submicron resolution range uh, and allow us for both in vivo and in situ studies. So this is really a, a goal that we have right now. I'm actually also working on that. Uh, and do I have any more time? How much time do I have? Yes. Oh, I'm very fast. Yes, That's good. Well, good. Excellent. Yes, <laughs> but but then I would like to to really push for for this, and I'm gonna. I want to use an example, which is my first imaging experiment, and some of you will think that it is uh, quite trivial, but I hope I will show you that it is not so very trivial in the end, and this is. This is actually some videos I took this because I was posting it. It was during a masterclass on food and I was documenting this because I usually post it and I try to educate the new generation on what can we do with this. And so this is Stephen Hall. He's fibbling with a sample and it's actually a sample. It is a sample of my hair that I have pulled out on the spot mm -hmm. there while we were doing the, uh, we did a lot of scanning on different types of, uh, of food stuff. So it's, it's quite, it's not so easy I just ripped it out and, and he was trying to set it up and we scanned it and we had to scan it all night. And I will show you uh, what it looks like. But as I was doing this, I was contacted by L'Oreal, a, mm -hmm. uh, a former colleague from, from the ILL who contacted me and said, oh, we have never done, well, they probably have, but he hadn't done it. Uh, can I see these, uh, can I see the images? And so we had a meeting and this is the hair. Um, it's let's see. We can see it's a it's a movie. I don't know if you see it very well. I can maybe point. So it's actually quite uh, interesting to see. You can actually see these uh, the fibers are, and this is not so trivial because I used to work at Procter and Gamble and we did a lot of experiments. I'm very interested in hair. So you can actually see a bit of the uh, uh, the cuticle. It's quite a damaged hair. It's gray hair. I colored it bleach, all these things, right? And uh, no, so I, I also went further because I asked, you know, I don't have children, so I asked if he could bring me, a, uh, if his child could donate a, a, his piece of hair called virgin hair that hasn't been treated. He was very happy to be part of the experiment, so he did. And that is so beautiful, I cannot show it next to mine. So it's really like no damage at all. But So this is possible is that that's where I ripped it and we need to do more experiments. Now, there are many points I want to make here and I want to show it running around again. So you're running out of time. I am, but I'm, I, will, <laughs> I will make a song. Right? So you see, I mean, you can see the keratin fibers, you can see some of the cuticle, it's hollow. Why is it hollow? Is it because it's gray? All these things. And what are these dots? And talking to L'Oreal, he told me, well, this was the product. I had put in Kerastas leave-in conditioner. In, mm -hmm. And why is it inside? It's supposed to be 
Awesome. Covering the hair, making smooth. Now I know why my hair is not smooth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, I mean, this is really not trivial because it is such a, we all use shampoo and we want it to work, right? And we want to be sustainable and we really want to push. How can we actually do that? And this gives us an opportunity. And I want to push this because we're going to do experiment with Formax, which will take less than a minute. This took all night. Now we talk about high throughput screening. But in order to do high throughput screening overnight and go over a thousand samples, we can't have Stephen Hall fiddling with that. So we really need to work on the autom standardization and uh, automating the, the current ignorance that we have if we want to push boundaries. That's the message that I want to leave you with. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, neutrons and X-ray scattering as superlative probes of quantum materials. Please. Thank you very much. And uh, so I'm uh, staying here as a, a guest researcher at Lynx, and I'm very grateful to Lynx for making that, helping to make that happen. Um, I'm also looking forward to learning about what's happening in Sweden. Uh, my interests are in quantum materials, which is not one of the themes that you've heard about uh, so far, although it does um, relate quite closely to one of the existing running themes on, on, on materials. Um, uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about this topic and um, quantum mechanics, of course, uh, underpins all materials to some extent, but the, the term quantum materials is usually referred to materials where quantum effects are particularly prominent. And uh, the scientific challenges are to try to understand why that is and to try to see whether well, you can do something useful with these materials. Um, time is short. Um, I want to illustrate how um, neutron scattering and X-ray scattering can answer some important questions in these materials, and uh, I want to do that by just giving you one case study of something that we've recently been working on, uh, where we've shown that a particular magnetic structure exhibited by a Eurokin compound has a, a has drives a sort of topological phase transition in the electronic structure. So that's the idea. All right, um, so actually, uh, most of the uh, devices, uh, electronic devices we use today do not have strong quantum mechanical effects. Um, however, uh, quantum materials uh, provide different capabilities, uh, which could potentially be used to, to improve these devices. So that's one of the motivations for studying quantum materials. They have potentially um, new capabilities for quantum technology, for spin tonics, for electronic materials, energy materials, and so on. And um, of course, uh, there is many quantum phenomena and materials platforms to investigate, but essentially the field is being driven by two big ideas. One is uh, emergence, and the other is topology. Um, um, a good example of emergence is a snowflake. We, we know that snowflakes are made of water molecules, but when you pack together lots and lots of water molecules, it's difficult to, to predict the, the beautiful patterns of snowflakes that we get emerge from this complex system. And electrons, similarly, um, when you put lots of electrons together in a solid, um, they don't necessarily behave like free electrons. They behave in many different ways. And uh, quantum interference effects and entanglement lead to properties such as superconductivity or magnetic order, or even um, cases where um, magnetic order is suppressed when you'd expect it to happen. So that's a sort of phenomenal emergence. Um, Topology, of course, is a branch of mathematics, but it's been applied in the last decade or two very successfully in, in condensed matter. Um, it's leading to new classifications of electrons in particular, and it's, lead, it's led to the prediction and subsequent discovery of um, new states, new quantum states, um, with useful properties. Okay, just back to school for a second. Um, Simplest quantum material is a ferromagnet. We know that ferromagnets at the atomic scale are made of uh, little atomic magnetic moments, which we call spins. And the interactions which cause the spins to align ferromagnetically, exchange interactions, uh, can have a positive sign or negative sign. If it's a negative sign, the spins will align opposite to their neighbors, and we have an anti ferromagnet. And if you fire a beam of neutrons or x rays at um, a magnetically ordered a compound, then the magnetic <coughs> pattern will, will act as a sort of diffraction grating, which will scatter the neutrons, create an interference pattern, and from that interference pattern, you can figure out the magnetic structure. And um, 
technique of choice, so the first technique you would go to to, <coughs> to solve a magnetic structure is neutron diffraction. Uh, and if you, like me, if you are uh, very fortunate that you live very close by uh, a world leading neutron facility, then you can take your sample there and measure there. You too will very soon have a world leading neutron facility on your doorstep. Um, so you'll be able to do that uh, here. And um, neutron diffraction is not uh, is a very uh, versatile technique. It's not just for looking at simple magnets. You can look at much more complicated magnetic structures. Uh, you can look at superconductors, uh, the flux line lights in superconductors. You can look at magnetic excitations. So you can do all sorts of solve all sorts of problems using neutron diffraction. Um, for most of um, the 20th century, uh, people didn't think that you could use uh, X-rays to study magnetism, but all that changed with the advent of synchrotron facilities, um, and especially the sort of discovery of development of resonant magnetic X-ray techniques. And again, uh, both you and I are fortunate to live next door to uh, world-leading synchrotron X-ray facilities for these experiments. And with synchrotrons, with, with resonant magnetic X-ray uh, techniques and synchrotrons, you, there's more capabilities which are complementary to neutron scattering. For example, if you have a sample which contains two or more different magnetic species, you can separately image the uh, magnetism on the two different species by tuning the X-rays to absorption edges of those two different elements and separate the effects. You can also use the ridiculously high momentum space resolution that you get at synchrotron X-rays to resolve very, very sharp features or overlapping features. And uh, these days, um, using the resonance inelastic X-ray scattering techniques, you can study magnetic excitations at high energies using X-ray. So very much complementary to neutrons. All right, so that's uh, my brief introduction to quantum materials. I now want to move on to a case study, which is in the area of topological uh, materials. So it's quite a new area, actually only about five or six years old, uh, this field, and it's very exciting. And I want to uh, show you some, I uh, sort of whip through some experiments that we recently performed on this compound, European copper arsenic, and show that this has a helical magnetic order, which induces a topological phase transition uh, to what's known as a bile metal. And this work was um, completed recently and posted in the archive on Tuesday. Uh, just a very quick mention word about topologic, topology and topological materials. Um, so the key idea here is what's known as the Berry phase, which is a quantum mechanical phase that electrons acquire when they, they make paths in, in solids, crystalline solids, uh, due to, for example, magnetic field or electric field. And these uh, Berry phases are very, very prominent close by when you get uh, linear band crossing, so these degeneracies in, in electronic states. And it leads to a weird kind of electrons which don't behave like normal electrons or bile fermions. Superconductivity, you can achieve uh, topological superconductivity and what are known as myron fermions, which are some excitations of this ground state and something called axial electron balance. Very, very new ideas. People are still figuring out what you can do with them. Uh, myron fermions are proposed to be uh, one way in which one can develop fault tolerant quantum computers. And associated with these effects um, are various measurable properties, um, which I won't go into the details of how these work, but these, these are essentially arising from interference effects due to this very phase. So uh, I want to talk about europium copper arsenic. Um, actually got quite a simple crystal structure. Uh, europium ions form triangular layers. And then sandwiched sandwich between these triangular layers, you have arsenic and copper. It was first synthesized in this paper in 1978, so it's quite old. Uh, its magnetic properties were explored in this paper in 2014. And these authors discovered um, a phase transition that took place at around 14 or 14 and a half Kelvin and shows a very strong signal in magnetization and transport measurements. And the assumption at that time was that what was happening was that the europium spins, europium is, is bivalent in this material and has a large spin quantum number, so large magnetic moments. The assumption was that they lined up in this pattern with ferromagnetic layers of europium spins, which uh, stack along this direction antiferromagnetically. So that was the assumption. 
based on, on the kind of characteristics of these bulk measurements. Uh, we wanted to check whether this was correct or not. So as I said before, the technique of choice is neutron diffraction. And when you don't know what a magnetic structure is, you usually start with counter diffraction. That essentially measures everything. Um, and uh, so you, you would take a counter diffraction pattern at 20 Kelvin, which is above the phase transition, another one below the phase transition. And sure enough, uh, some new magnetic peaks arise. Um, these ones labeled the M. And from that, you can produce a magnetic propagation vector, uh, which turns out to be 2 equals 0, 0 0.59. Just a moment, just a word about uh, Europium. Those of you who are neutron scatterers will actually, uh, would normally run away very quickly from compounds containing Europium because it has an enormous uh, absorption across section. Um, it's actually 50% larger absorption cross section than cadmium, which is a material that neutron spectra is used for, for shielding. So these experiments are, are, are quite difficult, and the transition of, transmission of these of this sample was only 1%. Nevertheless, uh, because the intensities of these the modern sources are so bright, one can, one can get very good data from these samples. Um, okay, so uh, the day after that experiment, actually, we had some beam time at, at Diamond, the Diamond light source, and for a sing, single crystal experiment using resonant magnetic X ray scattering, which is another technique for solving crystal structures or for probing crystal structures in three dimensions. And in this technique, you tune your X rays to, uh, in our case, it's the Europium L3 absorption edge, 6.97 kilo electron volts. And then you scan around. Um, where you think you, uh, your magnetism is, is existing in momentum space. And, and sure enough, uh, we observed some magnetic diffraction peaks here and here. And there's ways of telling that these are magnetic using resonance, using the resonance response and using polarized, the polarization of the, of the X-rays. And um, this also observed a magnetic propagation vector, which was not the same as what we observed in neutrons, um, but which was uh, similar. And we think this is a sample, there's a small sample dependence there. All right. Um, third experiment. Uh, uh, again, if you want to really uh, nail down the details of the structure, a good way to do that is to do a single crystal neutron diffraction experiment where you measure lots and lots of frag peaks and you, you match those to some kind of model. And so we perform these experiments for the Astrid Alidangela, where there's a very good diffractometer with hot neutrons, which um, evade some of the problems of absorption. And um, the result of this experiment was that we were able to refine a crystal structure which actually looks like a, a helix um, as you move along the, the vertical direction here. So ferromagnetic spins, ferromagnetic layers, but as you propagate along this direction, they rotate by an angle of approximately 90 degrees from one layer to the next to form a helix. So this is not the structure which had been assumed uh, by the early papers. Just to be absolutely sure, um, we use another advanced neutron technique, uh, which is available at the Institute of Lange, and called spherical neutron polarimetry. Uh, this is not this is a scattering technique, but it's not. But you don't actually use the scattering intensity to solve a, a structure. What you do is you put the sample in a zero field chamber, and you polarize the neutrons instant on the sample along some direction alpha, and then you measure the diffraction of those neutrons along another direction beta and form what's known as a polarization matrix, which is obtained from the intensity of the scattering from the alpha channel to the beta channel, minus the alpha channel to the minus beta channel, and then divided by its sum. So it's this polarization, which is just a number between minus one and one, to assemble this into a, what's called a polarization matrix. And the characteristic polarization from a, a mag magnetic material enables you to solve the crystal structure very, very easily. And one of the beautiful things about this technique is that if you have an absorbing sample like our Europium sample, is that the absorption correction cancels when you take this ratio. So this, this polarization matrix does not contain any effects or any corrections due to absorption. And um, okay, so then you assemble, so on, on the, these data points, these circles correspond to the, each polarization channel um, for a number of different magnetic reflections and the bars correspond to the model of the, the helix I just described, and you can see that this, this model fits the data very, very well. So that is the magnetic structure of this material. And then um, the question is, what stabilizes that magnetic structure? And the thing that stabilizes magnetic structure is the exchange interaction between the spins, and there's various paths that you can have exchange interactions. 
And um, to measure these exchange interactions, the way to do it is to measure the inelastic neutron scattering spectrum, which essentially measures the spin wave excitations of this uh, ground state. And so this is data from the ISIS, from the LET spectrometer of ISIS. You see this, this band of excitations or the band of scattering here. This is the, these are the spin wave excitations, and this is a model that we developed these excitations from which one can obtain quantitatively the values for these exchange interactions. Uh, the J0, this one here is 10 times bigger than these ones, J1 and J2. That's telling you this is a very layered two dimensional system. Okay, so this is a magnetic helix. What does that mean for the electronic structure? So, to learn about electronic structure, uh, you can do it by calculating the electronic structure using uh, functional theory, which our collaborators can do for us. And you can also measure it at synchrotron X ray sources using angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy. And um, I guess this, this slide has been a, a bit confused because uh, these pictures have come, up, come on top of what was behind it. I don't know if it's possible to reveal what's underneath that. But, but essentially, the band structure shows a, a whole bunch of four F bands here. And the, um, the interesting bands are these ones here near, near the chemical potential, which are the copper and the arsenic bands. And uh, if you blow up this point here, you get a picture which you can't see, which shows some band crossing points. So these so-called um, linear crossing points of the bands, which are the ones that create um, these viral nodes. So uh, essentially the band, band structure calculation predicts that this material in the helical magnetic state uh, has these so-called uh, viral points in the, in the structure. And um, RPES measurements, angular real photo emission spectro spectroscopy, was done to validate or to, to check that this band structure calculation was, was realistic and, and indeed it does match the the calculation could be well. So I'm going to stop now. Um, I, I'm not going to risk read out all the names. Uh, the person who, who mainly led this work was a former graduate student of mine, Jeremy Rousseau. Uh, lots of other people involved at facilities, theoretical collaborators, sample preparation. Grateful to each and every one of them. And um, so just to finish, um, quantum materials uh, this contain lots, lots of mysteries, uh, lots of surprising phenomena. and um, neutron and synchrotron x-ray techniques are incredibly powerful ones for answering those questions. Thank you very much. Here is Harald Wallander from Malmö University. Uh, <coughs> we'll switch here to surface science uh, and uh, learn about catalytic oxidation of CO. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So <clears throat> I'm from Malmö University and also connected to the synchrotron division at Lund University. Yeah, so I'll talk to you a bit about some experiments we did on these uh, surface alloys. Uh, so we heard already a little bit about the uh, MN's fresh express in the, um, in the max port talk, uh, and that's what we did. We followed uh, these reactions uh, of Arando. So a little bit of motivation of why we study this material. Uh, so platinum in itself is a catalyst that is used for many different reactions, <clears throat> but it has an issue with uh, CO. So CO has a tendency to bind very strongly to platinum and block the surface from any uh, uh, other species to absorb, which, uh, which kills the reaction at low temperatures. Um, but when you add tin to the platinum, then this problem is alleviated and uh, you can react away the CO at low temperatures. And it can be important that it is at low temperatures because some reactions have to be at low temperatures uh, or at mild conditions uh, and so on. Uh, so there are many applications uh, for this, but one that I like is the possibility to use this material in a fuel cell. Uh, so you can make fuel cells with uh, hydrogen, um, but it's more convenient to use um, alcohol or some liquid fuel, uh, but then you need a catalyst that is able to deal with carbon. Uh, and platinum tin has been used for this, and uh, we see some attention to that. But I will only present that with the oxidation. So this material has been studied uh, before. Um, so calculations, calculations have shown that under relevant conditions, uh, the platinum and the tin will segregate into tin oxide and platinum metal. And uh, it's also predicted that the edge sites between the oxide and the metal uh, should be active for the oxidation <coughs> at lower temperature. Um, we and others have also studied uh, <coughs> this material uh, in gas, and we've seen that the gas composition can itself affect 
the form uh, and the morphology of the oxide that forms. So you could have more bulk-like oxide and more uh, flat wetting oxides. Uh, and uh, some of them, these uh, thin 2D oxides have been studied and, we've, and they found the uh, structure for that and they can be quite complicated. So this is the kind of material system we have. We have something that forms these 2D uh, complicated oxides and our project is particularly interested in these 2D, 2D materials that are different from bulk and the gas composition affects throughout how which oxide that form. Yes, so we do <coughs> kind of basic uh, basic science, trying to figure out how these oxides work, and then we leave uh, the development of new and better materials to other people. <coughs> so that leads into our experiments. Uh, so we have platinum crystals that we put tin on top. So we make these surface alloys that are one or a few atomic layers thick. <coughs> Uh, so we do that to control how much tin we have and which faces and so on. Uh, and we also look at our step surface to see the influence of um, uh, having these steps and also breaking up the oxide that form. Now, I'm not sure I would have time to show you that, but uh, uh, you can come and ask me if you're interested. Uh, so when we had these alloys, then we went to max ball, uh, to the hippie beam line and put them in the ambient pressure uh, cell. Uh, so in the cell, then we flow gas over the sample <coughs> and we heat it up from about room temperature or so to 400 degrees and then uh, down again. And during this ramp, we record uh, X-ray photo emission spectra. And we also sample the gas just above the surface so we know uh, what species are in the gas. Uh, so then we measure it in this way of Arundel and try to figure out what the tin does and how it affects the rest of the system. Yes. So going into the results, I will first <coughs> show you the comparison between the thicker alloy and the thinner alloy to see how <coughs> they are different. Then we'll see how active these samples were. <coughs> and then if there's time or you can ask me, then you can also see what effect the steps have. Uh, so this is how the data looks like during a ramp. So at the bottom, and so here you have uh, XGS spectra uh, and uh, you get these peaks at different binding energies and the binding energy tell you something about the chemical state uh, of that element. Um, <clears throat> so for example, at these energies here, we have uh, metallic tin and if you have the components here have to be higher then you have oxidized tin in, in different states. So that's just a little bit about how the data looks and how you uh, analyze it. Um, and then I made line plots, so it's uh, a bit easier to follow the phases uh, as the temperature changes. Um, and at the bottom of these uh, image plots, then you have the original state of the surface. And then in the middle of the figure, then you have the maximum temperature. And at the top, you have after the temperature has gone down again. Yes, that's just a little bit about uh, yeah. the results that I will show and how you should uh, look at them. Okay. So then we can go into what actually happened. Uh, so here I compare the surface with a thicker uh, uh, alloy layer and a thinner alloy layer. And we start to look at the tin. So with a thicker alloy, then you first have an oxidation of the tin at about 100 degrees. And then this is a wetting surface oxide, we can tell from the, uh, from the thick assignment. And when the temperature goes up and down, it stays oxidized like that. And not that much happens to this surface after that point. If we instead look at the thinner one, then we see that the behavior is actually quite different. So <clears throat> you do have a growth of this uh, surface oxide again, uh, but then at high enough temperature, then you see that it's reduced back and you have the alloy and metallic thin back. Uh, and then at the maximum temperature, then all of the CO is being uh, converted to CO2. So then in effect, you have a very oxygen rich gas. So then you get the surface oxide back again. And then when the temperature is low enough for CO to go down to the surface, then you have this reduction again. So we have now two surfaces that behave quite differently uh, with, two, with two oxides. So to get a bit more information about 
what is going on, then we can look at the oxygen spectra, which are here. So here we can see the oxides as well, which are the green line. Um, uh, but we can also see the adsorbed CO molecule, which is uh, the interesting part uh, of this spectra. So I've circled here where those peaks show up in the ramp. So we can see in both cases, we have CO adsorbed on the surface when we start, but at the sample with the thicker uh, alloy, then CO does not reabsorb after the ramp. Um, so CO only absorbs on platinum. It doesn't absorb on tin or on the oxide. So it tells us how much exposed metal we have on the surface. Um, on the thinner alloy, then we do see that the CO does reabsorb. So that is telling us that not the entire surface is covered uh, by oxide. And that is the significant difference between these two samples. In one case, we have enough tin to form a wetting oxide that covers the surface. And in the other case, we do not. And we still have exposed metal and we have a more island structure of the ocean. Okay, so then we can go back to the behavior of the tin with the oxidation and reduction during the ramp and <clears throat> get a model of what happens. So our interpretation is that these surface oxides that form, they can be reduced by the CO on the surface, but they do that from the edge. So you need to have adsorbed CO to reduce uh, this oxide. Uh, because that is what happened on the thinner alloy, which have edges, but not on the thicker one, which does not. Um, with that, we can start to look at uh, how good the samples were. It's used for low temperature C oxidation, right? Uh, so let's see how they performed. So in blue here, I've plotted the activity of the sample with tin on. The red is a reference measurement of the same crystal, same mounting, but without the tin. Uh, so they should be very comparable. Uh, so if we see here, uh, so the difference between the blue and the red is some kind of measure of how much the tin helped the sample convert CO to CO2. And you can see that the blue curve is higher than the red. So the samples do convert more CO to CO2 than just platinum. And that is nice. It means that the conditions we study are relevant. Um, <clears throat> you can see also that the two uh, conversions here for the surface mm. with more tin and a covering oxide and the one with less tin and a not covering oxide with edges are very similar. Uh, you could almost believe that it's the same data set, but uh, they are different and they look very similar. So what is that telling us? And it means that these edges can't be uh, the important or like the only site where CO can be uh, converted to CO2. Because we have one surface with edges, one with no or very few, and they're both converting CO2, CO2 to CO2 at the, roughly the same rate. Uh, we do see that it's correlated with the growth of this surface oxide. So it seems uh, that the CO oxidation ability is related to the surface SO oxide, um, but that the edges are not uh, needed for this conversion. It's not the same uh, as to say that the edges aren't active. Uh, they may well be, <coughs> but there must be other active sites as well, well rather than uh, just the oxide. Yes, so, so then <clears throat> a bit more models for that. So our interpretation is that CO can uh, react to CO2 with the surface oxide from the gas phase, since it can do that on the surface that is covered and does not have any exposed platinum or any oxide edges. Uh, that the oxide can also be reduced by the CO if it's absorbed from the platinum and attacks it from the edge. Uh, we also see when we go into oxygen rich condition at light off, that uh, the oxygen content of the oxide seems to increase, which is also an indication that CO uses oxygen from the oxide to form CO2. Uh, yes, so some conclusions. Um, the tin improves the ability, uh, low temperature ability uh, of CO oxidation on the surface. Uh, the CO interacts with oxide edges and reduces them at sufficient temperature. And it seems like the improved activity 
is related to the outside itself uh, and not necessarily the edge. Uh, so how am I with time now? We have some extra limit. Ideally, it would be great if we could wrap <laughs> up because we're yes. running 20 minutes late. So <laughs> yes, then let's do that. Uh, so uh, just one slide from our collaborators. <clears throat> they looked at the oxidation of these alloys with uh, lean, so they get uh, microscopic images of uh, there will be a little movie up here where you can see, yeah, outside the doors, that's, that's cool to see. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so having more microscopy would be nice <clears throat> for these services. You don't have to get some. <clears throat> uh, so with that, then I come to my acknowledgement. So I acknowledge my supervisor and the people who are at the beam line and uh, with whom I discussed the results. Uh, also thank our funders for the project that uh, paid for us. And uh, I'd be happy to take questions if there's time or comments. And I thank you for listening. EM for in life sciences. And uh, the presenter is Anu Tiagi. So uh, basically, the purpose of me uh, talking about CryoEM here today is just to say that CryoEM is coming to Lund University. So extra people, please <laughs> be aware. But uh, yeah, all uh, we are not up and running facility yet. We are up and coming facility. That's why I don't have much to talk about. But since you are not all from life sciences, I will give you a brief background about the uh, uh, cryo EM in life sciences. So uh, these are all the structures that are from my projects during my uh, uh, research fellow time. So these are not things that are done here, hopefully soon. So cryo-electron microscopy, it's a, it's a technique in which we basically image the frozen hydrated samples. We collect 2D images, and these 2D images are used to generate three-dimensional structures. So most, uh, most popular techniques of uh, cryo-electron microscopy in uh, uh, life sciences are basically uh, single particle and cryo-electron tomography. When we will be up and running, we will be uh, actually uh, capable of doing both these techniques. So cryo-electron microscopy actually got its uh, due recognition after the Nobel Prize in 2016. There were three great scientists who got this Nobel Prize. Uh, where, and these uh, contribute greatly in today's modern cryo-electron microscopy. Jack de Boucher, he got the Nobel Prize because he vitrified uh, the, uh, the water. So he got his share because of that. Joachim Frank, he was the one who actually developed or invented the software to you know, process these images that are taken from the electron microscope. And Richard Henderson was the first one to actually use electron microscope to determine the structure. So from there on, there was a big resolution, uh, revolution in electron microscopy. So as the X-ray people very fondly call us uh, globologists, so electron microscopy has come a long way from globology to atomic resolution now. Uh, actually, it's a very funny instance. Uh, it was from my PhD times. Uh, I had a fellow PhD student and he was uh, working on a collaborative project and he had some protein complex that they wanted to determine the 3D structure of. They could not crystallize, so they had collaboration with the electron microscope uh, group and they determined the structure. The resolution of that structure was about 4.8. And uh, during the defense of his thesis, it was in Stockholm University, during the defense of his thesis, this collaborator was the friend of the opponent. And the opponent uh, was talking about his project that was ongoing in the collaborator's lab. And then uh, he just mentioned that uh, it's 4.8 resolution, it's a potato, it's a blob, what can you interpret out of it? And it was so disappointing because 4.8, it's not a blob, it's not a potato, but still, according to X-ray eyes, it's still a potato. But from that time on, uh, cryo-electron microscopy has done a lot. So from the first structure in, uh, from the, so from the first structure that was about 11 to 15 angstrom to now, when we have atomic resolution of these structures, electron microscopy came long way because two of the major breakthroughs. First major breakthrough was in around 2012, when the direct electron detectors came into picture. 
Before that, we were taking these through the images on the CCD cameras, and therefore we were compromising a lot of re uh, resolution uh, details. So because of the uh, invention of direct electron detectors, and also because of the invention of the maximum likelihood in 3D classification or the softwares for image processing, uh, the details of these cryo EM structures were more and more obvious in their structures, and we reached great resolutions year by year. So starting from about 15 Armstrong, we reached about 7.5 to 8 Armstrong during 2007, and after the electron detect direct electron detectors, we reached a resolution of about 2.8 in no time. And now, during current times, the highest resolution that we have now is 1.19 Armstrong. And these are all the uh, benchmark samples that have been done. So this is uh, epoferritin. And the resolution of this epoferritin right now is about 1.2. And this is uh, uh, another benchmark sample, which has reached about 1.22. So looking at this, I think it's high time that Lund University also gets cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, what I am saying, uh, what I'm going to say next is that it's not only just the, re the resolution that has improved better, the hardware of the microscopes has also gone better and better. As you can see, he uh, see here in this slide, even the maps that are coming from a lower end or a 200 kV machines are quite better and quite comparable to the high-end machines like the 300 kV electron microscopes. So it's not just to determine the structure that we need a very high-end machine, a 300 kilovolt machine. We, we can also do that by, by having a machine that is just 200 kilovolt, and we need to have the, the right detector and the right so resources to process the images of these uh, structures. So, what another great uh, uh, benefit of this technique that was quite evident was through the sad times of COVID-19 pandemic. So if you remember that this COVID pandemic started in uh, late 2019, so it was something around December it started, and these papers, they were already published by February 2020. So what was known at this time was that it took only three weeks from gene to structure. So not only it's a technique now that is reaching very high resolutions, but it is also a technique that requires very less time to generate these 3D structures. This, uh, the technique actually is quite simple. It does not require very high amounts of your sample. So you can the source of your sample can be any, it can be mammalian cells, it can be bacterial cells or whatever you, uh, you want to choose and then it's just to vitrify your grids, collect this, the data on the cryo-electron microscopes and just process your data. So the time required and the amount of sample required are both more beneficial than any other technique. So what we can do in Lund, at Lund, we have this cryo facility located at BMC. Uh, Derek Logan, he is the director of our facility and uh, I'll be taking care of your samples and I will be the facility staff. Currently, we have Vitrobot Mark IV to vitrify the grids. It's located in BMC C13, but we will have a new site again and uh, we will be moving soon in about two, three, two, two, three days time. So right now, again, as I said, we are up and coming facility, not up and running yet. Uh, and thanks to the efforts of uh, Derek, now we have funding in place. We have the funding to buy a 200 kV electron microscope, which will be housed in BMC. <clears throat> and uh, this 200 kilovolt uh, microscope will also uh, be capable of screening and uh, producing data set that is good enough to actually produce good structures. So, uh, Hopefully we will have a 200 kV machine that can uh, do the job here at Lund University. And uh, this is the current infrastructure that we have. So we have our Vitrobot, which is uh, Vitrobot Mark IV, which has uh, double-sided blotting capabilities and we can pr produce grids for both single particle and cryo-electron tomography. 
And then the existing structure is the collaboration with uh, chemistry departments. They have a Leica uh, GP uh, plunge freezer that we can use. Uh, they also have a 200 kV electron microscope, which has the cryo capabilities. It's ideal for the material sciences, but it is not ideal for the life sciences samples. So not good for the biological samples, but it's still there. Until we have our microscope uh, in BMC, we can use this microscope. And apart from our infrastructure, we can also use the national uh, platforms uh, like SciFi, the SciLife Lab. They have high air both 200 kV and 300 kV microscopes. And uh, for data processing, proce data processing, we have Lunark, which is a LUNT uh, resource. And uh, we can use these softwares like Cyprian, Reliant, and Cryospark. And lastly, I didn't want you to keep you long for your lunch. So that's why it's a very short, uh, short presentation. Thank you for listening. So we'll, we'll kick on straight away with, uh, with Samuela. Thank you. Um, and to give your presentation. <coughs> Thank you. So, uh, hi, hi, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I'm Samuela Mazzoni. I'm a PhD student of the University of Pisa and a junior guest researcher of the integrative pharmacology and drug discovery team at, at Nix. Uh, so first of all, uh, a brief introduction of uh, AML and the target of this research, the CD36 protein. So acute myeloid leukemia is the most common uh, form of leukemia in adults and the second most common among child. It's a uh, cancer of the myeloid stem, uh, stem cells. Uh, so characterized by uh, a proliferation of uh, abnormal proliferation of uh, uh, undifferentiated and non-functional hematopoietic stem cell, resulting in hematopoietic insufficiency. Uh, the first treatment is uh, commonly uh, induction chemotherapy to try to induce a complete remission, uh, known as seven plus three. That usually use uh, uh, seven days of intravenous infusion of C therapy with uh, three days of infusion of uh, anthracycline with the possible addition of uh, other drugs. And uh, as then uh, mm, uh, 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 consoli consolidatory uh, chemotherapy that may, uh, may include the allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So uh, despite the efficacy of the induction chemotherapy, most of the and the introduction of new drugs, and most of the, the, the overall cure rate is about 20% in adults and 65% in children, because uh, uh, most of the responders usually relapse and eventually die of disease. So the need for a novel therapy and overcome of uh, chemo resistance is the most challenging, uh, most important challenges in this uh, in treating this type of cancer. Um, a possible breakthrough could be represented by the target of this research, the receptor CD36. That's a transmembrane protein involved uh, with several physiopathological uh, function involved in uh, metabolic diseases as well as in cancer uh, growth and depositiveness. Um, one of the main function is the, to mediate lipid uptake and hyperlipid cells such as cancer cells show a strong lipid ability in order to support themselves with uh, a fuel and starting material to grow. Uh, in fact, it's in, uh, involved in several processes that boost, that boost cancer progression and in particular in uh, leukemic stem cells, uh, highly express CD36 and induce uh, uh, the bone marrow adipocyte, uh, induce light losses in the bone marrow adipocyte to fuel the fatty acid oxidation. It was shown that uh, the inhibition of fatty acid <coughs> oxidation disrupt the um, homeostasis of the cells, uh, increase their uh, reduction, uh, the reactive oxygen species production, and eventually induce apoptosis of the ANR. And it was also shown that the, the cell display in resistance, the main chemotherapeutic drug used in the induction therapy, also have an higher CD36 expression. So the, the inhibition of this protein could be to represent a valid strategy to tackle tumor metabolism and to expand the pharmacological therapies available. So this is briefly the background at the, that leads to the computational studies at the foundation of this research. Um, in fact, with the aim of identifying novel CD36 uh, uh, inhibitors, a consensus docking approach was used uh, 
on a, was applied on a per, perfiltrated library of commercial compounds bearing a negatively charged molecule. That can mean the negative charge of a fatty acid. Uh, a consensus docking is a, is a convalidated approach that combines several, uh, combines several uh, different uh, docking programs at the same time to improve the quality and uh, the screening performance of the docking. So uh, the best compounds uh, resulting from this stage uh, of the study was further analyzed through molecular dynamics uh, simulation studies to only select those molecules that were <coughs> able to uh, form a stable interaction with the, with the target. So at last, the seven compounds were selected for, uh, the, for the logical evaluation, resulting in the identification of the compound VS4 that can see on the right side of the slide. So uh, we decided to further characterize this compound and uh, we planned the synthesis to uh, efficiently afford the, the compound. Um, since the computational studies suggest that it's the E isomer that actually bind the protein, the, fo the synthesis focused uh, on the pure E isomer of the, of the compound. So um, in addition, we uh, also synthesized three other analogs bearing the substituent from one, one uh, phenyl ring of the molecule in order to confirm the uh, interaction points and to assess a preliminary structure activity relationship. So briefly, the synthesis uh, starts with the uh, uh, R-hydroxy aldehyde, conveniently substituted in the meta position, then uh, uh, the pro protected on the hydroxy group with the uh, methoxy ethosimethyl uh, moiety before being subjected to a Pleisenthal reaction to, afford, to selectively afford the E isomer um, compound 7A BRC. Then it was deprotected in uh, acidic conditions, subjected to a SN2 type reaction with the ethyl bromo or ethyl 3 bromo propanoid to a far confined now compound 9. And then finally, hydrolyzed in basic condition to give uh, the desired product. product. Uh, then, in order to verify and quantify the interaction with the, the CD36 protein, Compound BS4 was analyzed through surface plasma resonance or SPR. Uh, briefly, is um, SPR occurs when uh, uh, polarized light it's a it's a, uh, <coughs> um, electrically conducting surface, usually a thin gold layer uh, between at, at the interface between two media on the total internal reflection conditions. So uh, this generates uh, an electron, ch electron charge density waves called plasma that reduce the intensity of the reflected light at a specific angle known as the resonance angle that is proportional to the mass on the sensor surface. So in an SPR uh, assay, a uh, molecule called ligand is mobilized through various approach on the sensor surface and the sample containing the possible potential interacting partner in solution called analyte is uh, injected over the surface through a series of flow cells. Uh, the interaction <laughs> determines changes in the resonance angles as the molecules uh, uh, bind and dissociate. And this is recorded in real time in a sensor gram, as you can see on the right side of the slide. So by analyzing the the response profile at different analyte concentration, it's possible to gather information about the kinetics and the affinity of the interaction. Uh, so the compound was uh, analyzed uh, with this technique using a uh, Bicorp 3000 and the CHG chips. That, so in this particular case, a uh, biotelinated CD36 protein was uh, immobilized on the sur sensor surface through a streptavidin molecule. And this approach is is more advisable compared to other linking techniques because uh, it ensures a consistent and efficient orientation of the protein on the sensor surface. So it, uh, it allows reliable analysis with the use of less protein. Uh, so in this slide, you can see the, the, uh, the result of the SPR analysis. Uh, in particular, on the left side, you can see the overlay plot of different sensor grams resulting from uh, the association of VS4 at different concentration. And on the right side, you can see the plotting of the response at equilibrium against the concentration that can allow to, to create a dose response curve to calculate the affinity of the, the compounds, resulting in a low micromolar affinity binding. 
then in order to evaluate the actual uh, effect on the cancer cells, the lipid uptake and the cell viability was also assessed. The, in, this, in, fact, in, this, in, in this slide, you can see the microscopy pictures of the KG1 cell line, that is the cell line with the higher expression of CD36. This cell line is, um, as you can see, is uh, have a higher ability to update the green, pristine the lipid in green after 10 minutes of incubation. But when the novel CD36 inhibitor compound BS4 was added prior to the lipid, the, the uptake was remarkably reduced, as you can see on the right, right picture. Then um, also the, the cell viability was assessed. So using a chlorimetric assay, the viable cell were, uh, which are, were measured by their metabolic activity 72 hours after the inhibitor uh, addition compared to only the DMSO addition. And as you can see in the plot, where the 100% value uh, of the relative inhibitory effect correspond to the cell of all that, you can, uh, if possible, to determine the IC50 resulting in uh, 150 micromolar. So in conclusion, uh, we, thanks to in silico study, we were, we were able to identify a novel small molecule CD36 inhibitors with a low micromolar affinity that could suggest an additional therapy to, uh, for the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, this is definitely a promising starting point for future research that <coughs> needs to be uh, done. Uh, in the end, I, I would like to thank the links for this opportunity and also a special thanks to my supervisor in PISA, Filippo Minutolo, and to Karin Limbis that uh, are both part of the structure-based drug design of the, within the ITDD team that give me the, the possibility to come here and do the research. And so thank you. And thank you also for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. You can speak about atomistic simulation microscopic discussion. Yes, yes, right, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Michael, I'm from the University of Luxembourg and currently in the second uh, year of my PhD. And I will talk about uh, magnetic neutron scattering from nanoparticles. So let's say we are interested in the spin structure inside of these nanoparticles and um, magnetic so neutron scattering techniques are a um, yeah, very good technique to, to study these kind of things. Um, so first of all, I will talk a bit about the methodology. So um, basically we can talk about three main steps. So um, the first step, we um, start with some uh, micromagnetic Hamiltonian, for example, that we need some exchange interaction between uh, the optimistic spins um, or the demagnetizing field and so on. We can also include uh, temperature. Um, so this is, let's say, the, the, the biggest part of the simulation stuff. So here we, we need uh, several hours of uh, simulation time. Let's say when we take a big ensemble of nanoparticles, then um, also just for one parameter set, it could be that one simulation run takes um, five days. And um, then once we have re reached um, some equilibrium magnetization vector field from these simulations, um, um, we can compute a Fourier transform, and so in the end, we get, uh, let's say, the magnetic uh, sun's cross section that tells us um, what uh, is to expect from some scattering experiment. Yeah, so we below have some, some example pictures. So this could be, for example, how such a 2D magnetic structure looks like. There's one simulation where we have this um, DMI interaction. So it's an anti-symmetrical exchange interaction. And um, in the end, we see a spin flip sunspot section that's um, computed from um, such structure, for example. Um, so uh, to go more detail, um, we start here on the top left side. So when we would like to model such material, we start and um, first of all, think about which kind of material you would like to simulate. So we start at the atomic structure of this material. So for example, a crystal of uh, graphic lattice. And then we have to define which kind of interactions are now going on in this material. So what are the interactions between the um, atomic magnetic moments? Do we have um, exchange, of course, uh, so it's nearest neighbors exchange, or do we have super exchange? 
on and, and all these kind of things. Um, so, and if you would like to simulate a uh, nanoparticle, you of course also have to take into account that this particle has an outer surface and um, also on the surface, typically it is like this, that you have additional um, yeah, kind of interaction because um, the, the next nearest neighbor's atoms or the surface atoms, they are missing. So there's something else going on. And the big question is, of course, um, what kind of interactions in the end are really happening there? And um, that's, that's one open question. And um, so once you have uh, uh, yeah, decided which kind of um, material you want to model, then you have to think about which kind of uh, minimization <coughs> method or numerical algorithm I have to choose to simulate this um, in an optimal way. And so in the end, um, some, some resource from the simulation <laughs> might then be like a equilibrium spin structure. You can also simulate like a hysteresis loop. So you um, <coughs> calculate several um, equilibrium spin structures for several applied fields. And if you uh, take the average of the magnetization structure, then you can plot <laughs> such a hysteresis loop. You also can simulate phase diagrams and also um, like time behavior with spin dynamics. So this is, let's say, the, the research from the <coughs> magnetic simulations. And um, when we have all these kind of things, we can then think about uh, computing uh, the spatial Fourier transform. <coughs> we have also time behavior. We can also compute like time Fourier transforms to get intermediate scattering functions. But um, in our first studies, we kept it now like static. So we have more of this um, elastic scattering cross sections. And um, once you have the two-dimensional <coughs> cross section, you can also take some hard smooth average to get a 1D cross section. And again, do the inverse Fourier transform. So you get some correlation function that tells you about um, the scattering length scales in, uh, in real space. So um, here's one example how this looks like. So here we have um, uh, some kind of magnetization curve. And um, this is now a two dimensional structure with Jarczynski Morgi interaction. And now we can, of course, um, simulate the structure for different applied fields. And then if you go to lower applied fields, you reach some um, yeah, state where you get, for example, scomionic um, structures. So for example, um, this dot here, also these structures can be specified maybe as a scomion. And in the end, you can, of course, get the Fourier transform of this and the uh, sun's pattern. This is now more um, about these simulations for my PhD project. So this is about nanoparticles. Here again, you can simulate this uh, for different fields. And um, just for example, spin structure, if you one uh, spherical nanoparticle and you see inside of this nanoparticle, we have a inhomogeneous spin structure. And um, What's often used till now uh, to, to um, interpret experimental data is um, like that you use some super spin model. And so you um, assume that all the spins are parallel in this particle. But of course, um, in reality, it should not be like this. So you, you have in reality some inhomogeneity, and, and that's now of interest. Yeah. I mean, I can show this video now, but um, this would take too long. So then I will come to this. Um, to first, uh, yeah, let's say more educational paper we um, published. So this is about simulations of the stoner wolfhard model. So in this case, you have really uniformly magnetized particles. And the idea was here to see, okay, this, this kind of model we can see as a zero order model for the magnetization structure. And um, yeah, so from this, we can get, first of all, a nice result and um, see how the scattering cross section may look like. And then the next step, of course, we take inhomogeneities into account. So here, um, this result uh, was mainly to see, okay, in a, in a VSM, so in a, with a magnetometer, we can measure hysteresis loop of some material. And the information we get from such a classical measurement, well, yeah, it's more like you get the average of your, the average of the magnetization of your material. And um, if you take then a look into what's, what kind of information is now in the scattering cross section up to this model in this zero order model, we see that in the, um, in the scattering cross section, we see like the cor uh, correlation coefficients of our magnetization uh, distribution. So this is a really different information in comparison to these two kind of measurements. So let's, let's say for the 
magnetization curve, we get the first at uh, the zero order moment, and for the scattering, we get the first order moments of our magnetization distribution. So, and um, now you can plot all these curves also over the field from the Stormer Wolfhard model. So, on your one hand, you can plot this hysteresis loop. And now, what's um, now new, what we did new on this is let's say we also calculated these correlation coefficients over the, uh, over the loop for different applied fields. And then these are then linearly um, dependent. So they are linearly contributing to the sunspot section. That's what we see here. Um, yeah. Yeah, so principally here you can, again, have some picture where you can show all these observables. So you have the hysteresis loop and all these scattering cross sections. So, okay, now I come to some uh, particles with inhomogeneous spin structure. So if we talk, for example, about um, iron nanoparticles with a diameter larger than 10 nanometers, then it's typically <laughs> that you think about that you don't have a uniformly magnetized particle, but due to the um, high the atomic magnetic moment and the higher demagnetizing field, it's typically that you observe more vortex-like structures. So these vortices are induced by the magneto-dipolar interaction. And um, this was one uh, calculation from a colleague uh, from our group. So she simulated these particles and the uh, main feature you see in this one dimensional scattering cross section is, um, um, so on this blue, blue scattering curve is the, the state where you have a vortex in the particle and in the dark, the black curve, that's where you close to the uniformly magnetized state. So what we observe is, let's say at for low Q's, we see a decrease of the scattering cross section, and we also see some shift of the form factor oscillations. So, and this is what we see in the, in the Fourier space. And when you trans do the back transform to get some uh, pair distance distribution function, we see um, for, the, for the vortex state that we get such kind of um, oscillating behavior. So, this, this kind of behavior you can see like that you have your, your particle and your ghost particle, then you do the correlation. And, and this negative correlations, they come since you have like anti-parallel correlations. So this gives you negative correlations. And when you're in the fully polarized um, state, you only have like um, parallel correlations. So then the, the correlation functions are only positive. But this is some indicator how you can see if we have vortex type um, spin structures in these particles. So yeah, this was also some experimental data. I just will do it shortly. Um, here we also observe, like in the experiment, such negative correlation, which may might give some information. Okay, there are some vortices. Okay, now I will talk in the end about some smaller features. So we see this this vortex spin structure. We can see it as a large feature in such a particle. And um, now if we talk about smaller particles. Uh, let's say less than ten nanometers diameter. Then um, uh, for spin homogeneity, it's more relevant that you have some surface, surface effects. And these surface effects on this particle, they induce some spin homogeneities in uh, these particles. Yeah, so here again, comparison uh, vortex is a large feature. And uh, this, of course, will also give a, la a, a less um, a dominant feature in the sun's perception if such uh, structures. So here this was some simulation where we use this kind of Newtonian. So in this particle, we have like the exchange of the action. Then we have a flight field, and we have the magnetic crystal line, or let's say magnetic anisotropy. And this magnetic anisotropy we distinguish now between a core contribution and a surface contribution. So on the core, we have here uniaxial magnetic crystal line anisotropy, and on the surface, we have some um, the L model for the surface anisotropy, and this. This contribution, this um, will lead to spin inhomogeneities. So, and what we observe is if we increase now this surface anisotropy, um, this this sunspot section will be will be uh, more get more washed out. So, on the one hand, the, the form factor oscillations are dense, and uh, we see that um, the, the, the minima are shifted to larger cubes. But is, you see, in comparison to the vortex structure, it's a really small feature, and that might be complicated to really see this or extract this from some experimental data. So we'll see how this 
where it will go. So one one feature that is um, yeah something you can see more is let's say um, when you have take a positive anisotropy constant, then it's like this that the spins on the surface are pointing more uh, inward or, or outward to the surface. So they are more parallel to the surface. And then if you switch this, the sign of this anisotropy, the spins are more tangential to the surface. So this is again, like uh, again, a more large feature on uh, yeah, intermediate large feature <laughs> maybe. And um, this is but this one feature you really can see and in the transfer section. So if you have <coughs> this, this um, hedgehog like structure where the surface analog is positive, then you would observe such shoulder like um, behavior in the scattering cross section. And then if you have an artichoke like spin structure which comes from a negative analog coefficient, then you will see this more yeah, uh, peak like behavior. There is something you can distinguish in this uh, scattering response. Okay, so uh, for the outlook, um, of course, this, these are now some theoretical studies, and uh, we also should, of course, do some experiments. That's the, the, the next step. So we're uh, collaborating with uh, the group of Sabrina Wisch from the University of Cologne. They um, can um, yeah, prepare such samples. <clears throat> where we can make some measurements. So we have now one proposal for the ILL. Um, this was submitted in this year. And um, of course, we can do again several other simulations, maybe temperature dependencies, or we have uh, large water dynamics or something. So where the particles are also arranging in some, some thermal bars or so. And um, yeah, I would say, I don't know if I'm in time. <laughs> So then, I, in the end, I would like to uh, thank all the contributors. So Andreas Michels is my supervisor from the University of Luxembourg, and um, Matthias and Ivan. They are some postdocs in our group, and Evelyn, she's um, also a PhD student. And also, I would like to thank uh, Professor Hamid Kakhi from University of Peking. He's the second supervisor for me uh, for my PhD project. And I also would like to thank Elizabeth Blackburn for making you know, my research stay here in Lund uh, possible. So yeah, I had mentioned it in the beginning. So I'm currently doing a research stay from April to end of June. <coughs> and I would also like to thank the links. So Anna and Josephine and Daniel uh, to make this all possible for me here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Martin Martin Sanz is going to talk to us about uh, scattering techniques and uh, food. Thank you. So uh, yeah, my name is Marta Martinez. Um, I am a permanent scientist in the Spanish Council for Scientific Research, and particularly I'm working at the CL, which is an institute devoted to the study of food science. And as part of the Northern Lights uh, of Food topic, I will show you some of the uh, results that we've got using uh, X-rays and neutrons to study the structure of food. And something which is very exciting to me also is uh, how we can uh, investigate how food is uh, digested and what type of structures are generated upon digestion. So first of all, um, because I think uh, many of you are not working on the food science area, but of course, food is something that we find every day in our lives. So what, why are we interested on in studying the structure of food? Well, there are two main uh, drivers nowadays. And the first one is related to the, the current crisis in the, in the food uh, sector uh, related to climate change. Uh, we know that the resources are very limited, uh, more and more limited, uh, while we have the high demands on food. So the industry is looking for alternative sources of food. And then the other uh, question is um, uh, the impact of food uh, on the consumer's health. Uh, so people are more aware about, uh, of uh, how food are imp is impacting our health. And also there are more and more uh, specific uh, requirements for uh, food uh, products. So to comply uh, with specific dietary requirements. Also, people are looking for uh, bioactive foods and uh, some products which can bring some benefits uh, to the consumers. 
So to work on those two areas, it, it is essential that we understand uh, what is the structure of food so that we can produce these uh, novel uh, foods. And of course, uh, we, we can find the structures on native foods uh, like uh, fruits and vegetables, but also we can produce different structures to, uh, to generate products with uh, different textures or biological mm -hmm. properties, or able to, uh, for instance, produce a sustained release of bioactive compounds. So here you can see some examples of structures that we can generate in, in food products. We have hydrogels, uh, probably you have seen gelatins, uh, agar containing uh, products. Uh, some other novel uh, type of structures are emulsion gels, in which we have uh, uh, some type of gel structure in which we incorporate uh, an oil phase. Um, emulsions, of course, interpenetrative networks, and also aerogels, which are highly porous <coughs> structures. So um, what are the main challenges in terms of studying the structure of food? Um, of course, uh, microscopy techniques have been used for many years to study the structure of food, but sometimes um, it is difficult to assess the structure of uh, some components in their native uh, state because you know food is highly hydrated and some uh, components such as polysaccharides can uh, be highly modified if we are uh, preparing the sample in some way. So in that sense, scattering techniques are very powerful because we can see the structure of uh, native uh, foods and because uh, we can also try to simulate physiological conditions in our experiments, for instance, to study what is happening during digestion. So first I will show you very, very briefly uh, an example of what we did uh, in this case to study the structure of cellulose uh, in uh, plant cell walls. Cellulose has a very complex structure, uh, which is uh, hierarchically organized in different structural levels. So um, as you would understand, to, to, to have a, a suitable and robust model to, to, to simulate the structure of cellulose, we needed to combine different techniques to get an idea of the structure going from the molecular level up to uh, the macroscopic level on, on the cell walls. So I will show you how we were able to produce a model uh, combining uh, X-rays and neutrons, but also uh, uh, not only scattering, but also diffraction, and even going to higher scales using ultra small angle scattering. So after many, many years and many experiments combining uh, neutrons and X-rays, and like I said, uh, going into different uh, um, size ranges, uh, we were able to develop a, a theoretical model to, uh, to, to fit our experimental data and to see how the structure of cellulose in, in uh, cellulose hydrogels uh, was organized into different levels. And so uh, we call this model a kosher model uh, because it accounted for um, how the water uh, is organized uh, within this uh, structural organization of cellulose into different regions which are more or less accessible. And um, the good thing about this model is that it, it was first validated with uh, let's say, uh, simple uh, models or simple uh, samples in which we only had cellulose, but then we used this same model to, to investigate what was the structural role of different uh, polysaccharides which are abundant in plant cell walls. And so we were able to see differences, for instance, uh, between arabinosylans and thyloglucans, uh, while some of them were able to uh, affect the crystallization of the cellulose microfibers. Um, arabinosylans were interacting with the cellulose fibers more at the surface level. Um, and we also studied um, other polysaccharides, such as uh, mixed linkage glucans or even pectins. And we went one step further and we applied also this model to uh, more complex uh, samples uh, consisting on uh, real plants and walls 
extracted from different types of samples. Here you can see an example uh, of what we did with uh, apple cell walls, which were subjected to different drying conditions. And um, our model uh, gave us information on how the cellulose microfibers and the water that was interacting with the cellulose microfibers were uh, being affected by the drying processes, which also uh, helped us explain how uh, the polyphenols in, in apple were, um, were interacting with the cellulose and how, uh, how they were uh, being affected by this drying process. And so now uh, another area which is very exciting to me um, is the, the study of how a food is being uh, assembled and structured uh, upon digestion. So uh, as some of you may know, there, there has been a huge uh, advance in the food science area um, thanks to the in vitro methods to study uh, food digestion so that we know, uh, for instance, how proteins are uh, digested and the peptides that are produced uh, upon digestion. But what happens with the, these digestion products? How are, are they assembled? Uh, and how are they interacting with other components which are in the physiological medium? We don't know that. And there is, there is very scarce information on that, especially on the case of proteins. And so uh, my hypothesis is that uh, this uh, nanostructural assembly that is taking place upon food digestion will also be highly relevant to how the nutrients that are being released are going to be absorbed in the intestine. So it's not only the chemistry of the digestion products, but also how they are assembled. And I will show you two examples of this uh, line of work that we have started uh, some years ago, but we are still, because uh, you will see this is a very complex uh, question that we are trying to answer. So uh, this is a long-term uh, project. And um, well, uh, this uh, is related to the, to the digestion of uh, Oil gels. So, like I said before, these type of structures are uh, hydrogel uh, structures containing a, a oil phase, and uh, they are used in the food industry to, for instance, um, as uh, substitutes of uh, uh, fats uh, coming from um, uh, saturated fats. Um, so uh, here, what we did in this study is see how these structures are being digested and analyzing the structures that are being formed uh, uh, by the assembly of the digestion products. And so um, in this case, uh, the gelling agents were two different polysaccharides, carotinans and agars. And uh, we studied how the, the oil phase was distributed uh, within the structures and um, also the preparation method had a very strong effect on how the oil was di distributed within the, the oil gels. Um, we also studied how um, a, a bioactive component such as curcumin, which is soluble on the oil phase, uh, was uh, uh, affecting the, the structure and the digestion of the products. So, um, after digestion, of course, because we have uh, polysaccharides which are not uh, being digested, what we have is a solid phase which is not digested and it looks something like this, and then a liquid phase in which we have the digestion products. And so in this case, because we have a, a, an oil phase, uh, we were expecting to have some kind of micellar structures because, uh, you know, um, this type of uh, systems have already been studied. And um, first of all, we studied uh, what happens to the solid phase. So the, the polysaccharide, which is not being digested and no major structural changes were taking place. Um, only we could see that depending on the polysaccharide that we were using, it may be possible that some of the oil that we had trapped within the oil gel structure was not being completely digested and it was remaining in this solid phase. While in the case of the liquid phase, so what is being digested, 
uh, we were able to uh, find different types of structures. So the first structure is related to the uh, um, bisalt uh, mixed lamella, in which we uh, also suspect that uh, some of the digestion products, so the, the fatty acids and the triglycerides that were being released were also um, being included. And also, uh, interestingly, we observed that the incorporation of a very small molecule such as curcumin was having a huge impact on the type of structures that being formed. And then apart from this lamella, we were also detecting in some of the samples the presence of uh, some kind of vesicles, which were containing less digested uh, oil um, and uh, in some cases also curcumin. So especially this, uh, this bioactive uh, was, uh, it seemed to be uh, hindering the formation of the lamella, and in turn we had more of these vesicle structures. So this is uh, some uh, proposed uh, structural model that we, that we uh, produced based on our scattered data. And as you can see, it is very important, uh, the food structure, the structure of the initial product is very important, not only to explain the biological uh, uh, properties of the, of the food, but also it will determine the type of structures that are being, being generated upon digestion. And this, uh, we suspect uh, that will be very, very important uh, for, for uh, the absorption of the nutrients. And finally, um, since uh, we, we saw these results uh, on these ologels, we thought, what is happening to proteins? Uh, we are doing a lot of work on alternative proteins. Um, and um, we, we thought that it may be interesting also to check on what is happening to the peptides that are being released upon digestion. Can they interact also with the bile salts uh, that we have in the digestion medium? And so in this, in this case, we studied uh, the, the structure of hydrogels in which we incorporated a protein to uh, protect it from the, from the digestion. Um, again, here after digestion, we had a phase, a solid phase uh, containing the non digestive <coughs> polysaccharide and a liquid phase uh, containing the, the digestion products, mainly peptides. Um, so um, I'm not going into a lot of details uh, on this, but we observed <coughs> that uh, incorporating this protein into these hydrogel structures, we were able to modify the digestion pattern so that the protein was um, almost intact after the gastric digestion, <coughs> uh, whereas in the intestinal phase, uh, the peptides were being released. And uh, this would be what happens to, to this protein, which is casein, when it is not included in the hydrogel structure. So in the gastric phase, uh, the <coughs> enzymes, the pepsin, uh, can penetrate the, the structure of the, of the casein micelles, and they start to swell and separate uh, to form uh, this type of network. Whereas in the intestinal phase, uh, the, the structure of the casein micelle is completely dis disrupted and what we have is free peptides, but these peptides seem to be uh, interacting with the bile salts in the medium so, so that they are forming some type of uh, micellar structures. And so this is what I was uh, commenting. Uh, in the intestinal phase, it seems that these peptides are interacting with the uh, bile salts in the physiological medium. And so they are forming this type of lamellae. Um, but also uh, if we have uh, some uh, larger peptides, which are being less digested, they can also form uh, this type of vesicle. And this again was confirmed by doing some TEM. Um, I think cryo TM will be very useful uh, to get more insights on uh, what type of structures are being formed uh, upon digestion. Um, and again, uh, we can look at the structure of 
uh, the polysaccharides will which are not being digested. Uh, in this case, uh, we didn't see uh, many big changes, but uh, some conformational changes on, on, on some polysaccharides, such as the carotenoids. But the interesting part is uh, how um, the protection of this uh, casing upon digestion modified the, the type of structures that were being formed uh, in the digestion products. So um, I would say in the gastric phase, uh, the, the change was not so different, uh, was not so big as compared to the, to the raw casing. But if we look at the intestinal phase, we can see that the, the structures that were being formed in the presence of the polysaccharides were quite different uh, to those that we observed in the pure casing. So, uh, we still had some uh, lamellar structures, but since the peptides uh, were being, uh, or not the peptides, but the protein was less digested and we had larger peptides uh, uh, being released, we observed a larger proportion of uh, vesicular structures. So you can see here again uh, how um, the structure of the digestion products from the pure casing uh, is quite different to the structures that we were able uh, to detect on the digestion products from this uh, protein polysaccharide hydrogels. And uh, what we would like to do now, since these are very complex systems. We have several components uh, because all of this was done using x-rays. I think the next step would be to, to do some science experiments in which we can play around with the uh, contrast and the uh, difference rate between the structure of the polysaccharide and the protein. Um, also, I think uh, nutrition will be very important here also to, to play around with contrast. And of course, combining this uh, with microscopy techniques, I think that will be the way to go. Um, so with this, I would like to thank all my team and people from other institutions uh, who have collaborated in this uh, project. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, so people using neutrons and x-rays, uh, both in national and international universities, whether it be the faculties of engineering, science, and medicine, and uh, aimed towards postdocs and PhD students mainly. Uh, we had our first symposium now in March 2023. Uh, today we're planning for the next symposium, which we hope to be preliminary at least in October 2023 in autumn. Um, and we had a full day symposium. Maybe you want to go through these parts. Okay. Yeah. So um, can you just yes. Bring, yeah. bring it bring in. Bring it all. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we started with uh, an icebreaker session where, so the aim of this uh, symposium was not just having talks, but also having good interaction between all the participants. So we started with an icebreaker session where they were given some <laughs> some funny questions and also some science related joke questions which they were supposed to talk. But uh, in the end, we learned that people did not really use it a lot, but they did talk a lot and they interacted with each other. Uh, then uh, we had a model of 15 minutes presentation and uh, 10 minutes uh, questions. And uh, between the sessions, we had science speed dating where uh, uh, you could, you were given five minutes to talk with uh, your peers and participants and then you would ring a bell and then you have to run around the room and talk to other people and our aim was like again for uh, as much as people who are here in the room uh, should interact with each other and know each other and maybe in future who knows if they lead to this collaboration or some uh, networking uh, and in the end we also uh, once all of this is done we had uh, an intense intense discussion on uh, uh, our current events, our future events, and what all the people would like us to bring it on and discuss in future. And if they want us to really focus on specific topics for our symposiums, and uh, if they want someone, like want us to someone to, to invite some specific people from specific genre, like industry or all those things. So 
yeah this is this was the whole event about for that one day and we would like to improve for like bringing in all the feedbacks that everyone has given to improve it in future so mm. So this was actually all of the different uh, institutes that was part of the first symposium, even though we didn't have, uh, you know, we, we didn't need a huge budget even, we just provided uh, uh, coffee and lunch and, and uh, afternoon coffee, and we had people from Lund University, we would have, also have international speakers from, from Switzerland, PSI, from uh, University of Hamburg, and from oh, Denmark, from Audius as well, yeah. And then there was people both uh, online and physical. Actually, the, uh, we had 62 registered participants and 12 of those were, were online. Everybody else was physical. So it was actually uh, full. Uh, we were at full capacity here in the Schurtenberger lecture room at the uh, links a big, about a week before the actual event. So we had to, to shut it down. So we might have had uh, more registrations if we had a bigger locale. Um, so that was really nice to see that people came here to, to you know, to network, to interact, to talk to each other. Uh, we had 10 speakers, uh, that's the ratio, 50-50. And uh, yeah, we had the LinkedIn post shared a couple of times, 10 times, on, on, which was good. I think that also attracted a lot of people to register for the event because uh, different professors, for example, from Lund University or from other universities would share it to their network and, and uh, it resulted in quite, quite a, a peak, uh, a spike in the, in the number of registrations. And uh, yes, yeah, so we, Swati was talking to you about these activities and topics, icebreakers, these were the type of like silly questions that we uh, <laughs> asked, such as uh, conspiracy theories you believe in, <laughs> or go to dance movie, you just see a person like in the corner, kind of like dancing awkwardly. Uh, but it was also quite, quite tricky to, to include, you know, different uh, biophysical techniques, both in neutron scattering and in X-ray scattering science. Uh, but we, you know, these are the kind of topics that were part of the this symposium. Uh, but then we also asked for some feedback, and people just, you know, threw in these little post-it notes into a jar because nobody wanted to talk <laughs> live in the room when I asked them questions. And some were constructive, some were, you know, less constructive, like neutrons are much cooler than x-rays. Uh, yeah. we've, ta we've taken that on board for the next uh, symposium, of course. Uh, but other things like imaging of larger tissues, like we, because both me and Swati, we come from, you know, more or less from protein, protein science, you know, a lot of our talks was about proteins. And then one of the, uh, maybe we'll talk about this in the discussion later, but one of the hardest things for the symposium was to get the people, to get the speakers, uh, find the speakers, because if you go to the Lund University website, you'll go to faculty of uh, whatever, science or engineering, and then you have to find the correct the department, the PI, does the PI have a website? Does he not have a website? Does he list what he does for research? Uh, does he list his PhD students, his, his you know, postdocs? And all of these different faculties and all the different departments and all the different institutes all have their kind of own structure or layout of the web page. So for example, the person who wrote this image of larger tissues were a group of three poor uh, you know, PhD and postdoc students that came who were from, I found them in uh, the Faculty of Engineering Department of Biomech medical engineering institute of biomechanics and within that institute i found these people who were looking at achilles tendons in feet um, and so they were very pretty much alone uh, at the symposium looking at these larger tissues and most people were talking about protein and, and such things so uh, yeah we we would like to have um, a kind of this, like they suggested, a multi-scale type of view. So not only include neutron and X-ray scattering techniques, but also going from protein or atomic scale to the whole tissue. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is not for you to read really. This is just a mind map from our meetings that we have uh, now and again. Uh, but what we want to include, for example, uh, in the coming one is visits to facilities, both Max and ESS. A lot of people wanted to see, uh, have career talks, both from beamline scientists, instrument scientists, industry and infrastructures such as SciLife Lab. 
uh, and some people wanted to have topic specific symposiums. So on Alzheimer's, they have a symposium just about Alzheimer's research. Mm -hmm. But of course, we were trying to get people to join our core group so that we can, so they can organize branching yeah, events. Yeah, we can branch the yeah. events. Like if you want to organize okay, we, an we, event, for example. We better move on to the next Yes, yes. and that's it. Thank <laughs> that's you. It. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Sandra, Constantine, and me, we are planning this. Uh, so I will show very shortly one slide about that. And then a uh, second topic um, of a workshop that I have organized here in uh, links was the workshop on magnetic sense data and software development, uh, which I will mention the second point. But for the first one, this is from Sandra, Constantine, and me. So you can go to the next slide. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so we plan our event in November. We would also like to concentrate on the networking part between the young researchers. We would like to concentrate on PhDs, postdocs, and young researchers in general. So <coughs> even if it's not called postdoc, but you know, a young beamline scientist or so, <laughs> then this is uh, our interest. We would like to concentrate on corporations. Uh, between them, so we would like to uh, get to know in the meeting who is doing what and where in and around Sweden, so Denmark is also okay, and uh, I would say Germany is also okay because we like sure. Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so our schedule is that now um, we are still confirming the speakers for our event in November, and uh, after that, then when we have the confirmed speakers, then we can make a precise schedule and cost um, overview. And that was for the Young Researchers Initiative, if that's for you want to add something. Um, maybe just that we have, I think by now, four people confirmed or something um, from cultural heritage. We got somebody from, I think, um, I put myself in a pity, like from uh, an Argus beam line. So we're also trying to really spread out and get people like, if you don't know the technique, you don't need to. The plan is that people basically introduce the technique and then following up on their research example, you maybe get some ideas how you can use that for your own. Yeah, example. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. And the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so this is just another event that I've organized together with Wojciech Podrowski. <laughs> uh, also at links, that's why uh, I just thought I will also shortly introduce, maybe if someone's interested in the data and software according to magnetic sense. We had one, one workshop last year, June, where we sat together for two days with a very international um, round uh, and have basically analyzed uh, what is currently missing in the current data and software tools to mm -hmm. analyze uh, magnetic sense data. And now in April this year, we have met again to implement the ideas that we have collected last year. Uh, and this was mainly concentrating on ZASU as software uh, tool. And um, yeah, now we are thinking about if we perform this as regular meetings, or if we combine it with other magnetic sense uh, workshops, for example, next year, there will be one in Bartholomew in Germany. Uh, so maybe one can combine because the community is not that broad and it is very international. We had speakers from USA and for only one or two days coming to Sweden might be also hard for them, but also making it online is not so nice. It doesn't give the same output. So maybe combining this is also a good idea. So these are things that we are currently thinking about. And for this, I want to thank uh, the Lynx team that we have been possible to run this here. Yeah, uh, yeah. if there are any questions to this, uh, then you can ask me now or later. Yeah. Thank you. But I am here to talk about SciLife Lab, which I usually start my presentations by asking people if you've heard of it, but you have mentioned it already in the room. So I know that my work there is halfway done. Uh, my name is Esther, like I said, like uh, Andrew said. And then I pronounce my last name Gonzalez and not Gonzalez because I am from the Canary Islands and that is also correct. <laughs> um, but yeah, so SciLife Lab, uh, we have a site in Lund. And I guess um, 
maybe I can start by telling you a little bit about Scilab Lab on a national level. Um, and what are we, what is it that we do? We're a national hub and we're focused on advancing molecular life sciences. Um, why do we want to do this? Because we want Sweden to be at the forefront of life science research. And we know this is an ambitious goal, but we have a mission and we know how to accomplish it. And we do that by enabling life science research that could not be possible otherwise. What this means is that if you have a research question or a project that cannot be answered by a single individual or a single group or organization, or even within a single discipline, we try to provide the collaborations and the connections that would make this possible. So then what Scilab Lab is, is a national research infrastructure. It's one of three government funded infrastructures. Uh, the other two, you know, you know them, is <coughs> Max and ESS. And it started in 2010 as a joint effort by four universities in the capital region. But through the years, um, there's been like a um, massive interest in making Scilab Lab truly national infrastructure. And we are very dis distributed these days. We have representations in all major Swedish universities and in seven different cities across Sweden. So Scilab Lab is based in three dimensions or pillars. Uh, the first of them is research. We have a broad um, community of scientists and researchers in the form of um, research groups or group leaders at Scilab Lab. And they cover a broad range of scientific fields. And then we also, oh, sorry, I changed the slides recently. Yes, we also have infrastructure and that is represented by 10 technology platforms um, and more than 40 research units that cater for more than 3000 projects a year. And then this is how the research units are in the platforms. <coughs> sorry, um, how they are distributed. And then in green, we have the ones that are present in Lund. And these are the ones that are directly linked to national platforms, but there's more to this and I will get to it. And then the third dimension or the third pillar is the data-driven life science. And this is a 12 year Wallenberg funded program. And we are trying to accelerate a paradigm shift towards data science, uh, data-driven data life science. Um, we are currently recruiting global talent, both in the forms of PhDs and postdocs in academic and industry programs. And the idea is to create, like I said, collaboration and where innovation and interdisciplinary science can happen. In Lund, the, so the DDLS program or the Data Driven Life Science program has four strategic research areas. And then those are represented in Lund by our two fellows, Camilla and Jacob. And they are working in epidemiology and infection biology and in physician medicine and diagnostics. What else is interesting about Scilab Lab? We have some joint services. So one of these ones is the training hub, which was launched just this year. And what this will provide is a comprehensive portfolio of training and support for the research community and an easy way to access Scilab Lab or to get introduced to how we work and what we can do for you. Yes. And because we're focused in interdisciplinary science and we have three established fields, that require interdisciplinary science. We call them capabilities or cross-platform capabilities. Uh, the first one is planetary biology, where we basically can study life in its environmental context. And that covers anything from a single molecule to whole ecosystems. Then there's pandemic laboratory preparedness. And well, as we know, during the you know what years, um, it was necessary to create several initiatives that would allow for collaboration on a national level but also open data sharing. So this is still useful to this day because the pandemic is still ongoing, but it also helps us be prepared if or when the next one happens. And then precision medicine, which is also an emerging field and where the, the premise is that some patients can benefit from personalized treatment based on their molecular disposition. And this brings us in close collaboration to the healthcare system in all the um, cities where we have representation. So Scilab Lab Lund, what do we have? Who are we? Where, where can you find us? Um, we're a hub for multi-level collaborations. 
And we collaborate with Silent Club, but also with other stakeholders that are present here in Lund. The team so far is uh, myself, I'm the site coordinator, and Marcus Heidenblatt, who will join us shortly um, after, because um, he's been tied up in meetings the whole day. And you can find us at BMCT14. Um, and then we'll, our collaborators or our, our network here in Lund um, is, of course, with the research community. And that comes in the form of Silent Club group leaders and the DDLS, VCMM, or WASP fellows, as well as the SFOs. Then we also have access to those Silent Lab services like the data center or the training hub or the cross platform capabilities. Uh, we have connections with Lund University at these three uh, faculties of medicine, science, and engineering. We have access to other nationally relevant uh, research infrastructures, as well as unique local actors like the healthcare uh, sector, Max4, ESS, InfraLife, industry, and links now. And of course, many more are coming. We're just one year old in Loon, so we're just getting started. And then in terms of infrastructure, inside the bigger Silaf Lab um, of possibilities within Silaf Lab, uh, we have access to all of these ones that I mentioned before, the training hub, the DDLS program, the, the Silaf Lab uh, WCMM fellows, but we also have our very specific infrastructure, which in Lund are represented by the six units that I mentioned before. So we have access to bioinformatics and cryo -EM, uh, which you already heard a little bit um, Anu speak about this. Uh, we have access to clinical genomics Lund, um, CBCS, structural proteomics, and human antibody therapeutics. And then we also have two unique local core facilities that while they're not directly connected to the technology platforms inside that lab, they, are still, they still have similar mission or, um, yeah, <coughs> missions aligned with Silent Lab's um, umbrella. And that are, those are represented by BioMS and LBIC. So I know this is a, a lot of things going, we're still getting started, um, but if you have any project that you would like you know, help from Silent Lab, the best way is to contact us. That QR takes us to our contact you to our contact page where you can have links to all of the units included in Silent Lab. But also you can just drop by BMC, send me or Marcus an email. We are very happy to answer any of your questions if you have any. Or you can alternatively just join us for the Silent Lab Day in Lund, which will happen on the 28th of September. Everyone's invited, feel free to save the date. The registration link will come up probably next week. Um, so we will send that to some, whoever's in charge of the newsletter. So that will be also the links newsletter. And uh, that's uh, it from me.